Yeah, see, I got long arms too, so I'm pretty good. To call to order the March meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to those who are joining us in the boardroom and via live stream today. I would also note we have several regents attending via Zoom, Regents Davenport, Farnsworth, and Regent Tad Johnson. Let's turn right to our business. Our first item is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there second. a second? Is there a second? second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Boy, this is going to be tough today. All right. <laughs> Any discussion? Got to speak up. Yeah. <laughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The motion is approved. Next, we will hear the report of interim president Ettinger. Thank you so much, Chair Mayron and the members of the board. It's been a busy month for the University of Minnesota and certainly no less for all of you. So I'd like to start by congratulating you on your choice of Dr. Rebecca Cunningham to serve as the 18th president of the University of Minnesota. There's no question that she's immensely qualified to steer the University of Minnesota going forward. She's the leader at an outstanding institution, the University of Michigan. She is committed to research excellence and has her own impressive research credentials. She's worked extensively with faculty and students. She's familiar with legislative outreach and interacting with donors. And she comes with a huge added bonus, extensive personal and system knowledge about medicine and academic health. And I'll add my voice to the chorus of compliments regarding the board's selection process. The presidential search went as planned and on schedule, and it yielded three finalists who all agreed to be public. The first time this has happened in anyone's memory, enabling the full university community to be able to judge the merits of each candidate right along with each of you. As the Star Tribune editorial said last Wednesday, the search process was a testament to transparency that resulted in three exemplary finalists. Also, each of the finalists spoke about how smooth their trips around the state were and how well they were treated. I commend the Board of Regents staff for your planning, execution, and hospitality. And I also offer heartfelt thanks to our colleagues at Morris, Crookston, Duluth, and Rochester for making those visits so successful and memorable. <coughs> Rest assured I will do everything I can in the coming months to ensure that Dr. Cunningham has the smoothest of transitions to the University of Minnesota. Together, we can keep this great university on a positive trajectory in terms of our mission and in terms of a public perception that deservedly matches our success. I'd now like to provide you with an update of my priorities that were given to, you, given to me by the board for my interim presidential year. A consistent theme of these mutual priorities was the idea of seeking to accomplish a public reset in terms of how the university is perceived by others. We'll start with the public outreach area, and in particular, the Dear Minnesota campaign. I can provide you a brief update on these marketing efforts for this year, which have been led by Chief Marketing Officer Ann Aronson and her team. We launched the Dear Minnesota campaign in the fall to reverse the trend of declining perceptions about the university's research mission and to improve our favorability among Minnesotans. We've now conducted early market research to measure the campaign's effectiveness among the general public and opinion leaders. After just this short period, results show significant double-digit improvements. Favorable feelings about the University of Minnesota are up 11%. Those who believe that the University of Minnesota research is important climb 12%. Those who believe that the university is doing a good job of conducting research increase by 7%. All of these metrics are statistically significant and projectable across the state of Minnesota with a 95% confidence rate. We've also seen broad use of the campaign by campuses, colleges, and units across the university. We will be conducting more market research toward the end of the campaign as well to measure its performance. The second major area in terms of public outreach has been public relations in general, and our our attitude here has been just say yes, get out there as often as possible. I did an interview with Kara Levin this week that should air early next week. We've been regular attendees at the Star Tribune editorial board. 
I had an opportunity to talk with the State Chamber of Commerce last month. And of course, if you go way back to Farm Fest and the State Fair and those type of activities, those have been important as well. A third area of public outreach is the legislative area. And of course, the hiring of Melissa Lopez Franzen and her ability to create a great team already have really been instrumental in, in regaining momentum in that area. As you know, the Minnesota legislature began its session on February 12th, and we have hit the ground running with hearings and presentations in front of a number of committees. <clears throat> Led by Executive Director Lopez Franzen and her team, we have presented informational overviews on our capital budget request and the supplemental budget request to the State Higher Ed Committee, the House Capital Investment Committee, the House Higher Ed Committee, and the Senate Capital Investment Committee. Our first of the two hearings with the House Higher Ed Committee overlapped with our annual U of M Day at the Capitol, where students, faculty, staff, alumni, and nearly every one of you showed up to show their support for the University of Minnesota. The day started with our marching band playing on the steps of the Capitol to kick off a rally that featured testimonials from students across the system. After a chance for advocates to meet with legislators, the event featured an afternoon showcase in the vault at the Capitol. Two members of the Gopher football team even brought along Floyd of Rosedale, all 98 pounds of him, <laughs> our hefty trophy that was gained from beating Iowa last fall, which added to the spirit of the occasion. I'll continue to be engaged with state and federal legislative leaders throughout their sessions. I'd also like to recognize and thank our two faculty legislative liaisons for this year, Professors Donna Spanis Martin and Robert Blair. We continue to need everyone's voice as we speak on behalf of a stronger and better University of Minnesota. So that was priority one, but it has various subparts. Priority number two, healthcare, in particular the Fairview deal. Uh, as we, we spent a lot of time about this deal last meeting, uh, really gratified that the board approved the non binding letter of intent. We are in, engaged in ongoing discussions and work on, on a positive basis, and I think we uh, have a much improved public posture from where we were several months ago. Uh, we also always like to point out that while Fairview in the Twin Cities is certainly a very critical element of our overall medical system, we have all sorts of other things in our system, including the center care that, uh, arrangement that this board approved here this year, and our great work at our University of Minnesota Rochester campus on a regular basis in the healthcare area. The third priority that the board asked me to work on was financial stewardship. And I think, you know, why did you ask me to work on that? I think it was a combination of that clearly higher ed in general is confronting challenging times when it comes to some of the financial demands. And also perhaps maybe I could provide a fresh set of eyes of coming from the private sector in looking at that. So I've learned in, in my months here and working closely with the team that this institution has tight financial reporting and control systems. <laughs> It has a proven budgeting process that's both top down and bottom up and very extensive participation. And this one, you don't have to take my word for it. We have an excellent credit rating, which is an outside agency that looks at the, the solvency and the solidity of our, our, of our system. There is a narrative out there in, in the greater press or in the greater world that, oh, higher education has runaway spending. And so I thought, OK, I'd like to see what what is our spending been in this institution? If you look at it over the last 10 years, we'll put aside the most current year for the moment, but if you look at the 10 year time period prior to that and just look at total costs each year, the compound annual growth rate of those costs are about 2.9%. I mean, at least from the vantage point I came at, that is not runaway spending. The most recent year was higher with all the inflation that was going on, it was over 4%. And indeed our team is working on now delivering a budget to you that will try to move back toward more of the 3% level. Um, we're also, one, one of the other areas in terms of financial sustainability has clearly been some of the challenges that our greater Minnesota campuses have faced. We're in the process of looking at all our system campuses with an eye toward both enrollment modeling and financial sustainability and how the mission of each institution fits into that. And we look forward to reporting back to you. All those campuses will be here at the May meeting and we'll be providing you with those presentations. The fourth and final priority has, is campus safety, but we have a specific presentation coming later in the agenda on campus safety, so I will save comments on that until that time. 
I do want to provide an update on the Cloquet Forestry Center. In early 2023, the university announced its intention to return the land on which the Cloquet Forestry Center resides to the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Related conversations and discussions have continued and progressed since that time. As a next step in that process, the university hosted a public engagement session last month at the Cloquet Forestry Center. It was a welcome opportunity to engage with members of the Fond du Lac Band, local community members in the broader Cloquet area, as well as our forestry program alumni and others in the forestry industry. The overall tone of the session was respectful, providing space for a number of different speakers to express diverse range of opinions. There was an overarching sense of optimism that, with the land under the care of the Fond du Lac Band, that close collaboration between the U of M and the band will allow mutually beneficial research, education, and outreach to continue on the land going forward. I'm pleased to share that the legislation was introduced in the both House and the Senate, and we met with the Senate yesterday, that's the state and local government committee, as a next step regarding the return of the land to the Fond du Lac band. We are also making great progress on the search for our next chancellor of the Duluth campus. Next week, the three finalist campus will visit UMD and participate in interviews with key stakeholder groups. Each candidate will also present on their vision for the future of UMD and take questions during public forums. Additional details can be found on the UMD Chancellor Search website. I'm grateful for the search committee for their work in reviewing applications, conducting first round interviews, and ultimately recommending the three finalists who will be on campus next week. My special thanks to Chancellor Lori Carroll from the Rochester campus and Lisa Irwin, UMD's Vice Chancellor for Student Life, who have served as co-chairs of the search committee. South Dakota recently announced that they will be ending the reciprocity agreement with Minnesota. The current ag agreement impacts both our U of M system and the Minnesota state system. Under our agreement, currently enrolled students are grandfathered in. We are thus committed to ensuring that current South Dakota students will have their reciprocity rates continued through their graduation. Because this news comes so late in the admissions cycle going forward, we are planning to allow South Dakota undergrads who enter in the fall of 2024 to pay the reciprocity rate as well. Because Crookston and Rochester do not charge a differential for out-of-state tuition, no adjustments will be necessary on those campuses. The Duluth campus will be requesting to include South Dakota as part of a previously planned and board-approved Midwest tuition rate that they are planning to roll out this upcoming fall. That request will be part of the board's upcoming spring budget approval process. For the Morris and Twin Cities campus, we intend to offer tuition waivers for South Dakota students entering in the fall of 2024 to bring their tuition to the reciprocity rate for, the four, for four years for incoming new freshmen and three years for transfer students. Because graduate and professional programs have tuition rates that are set separately and often independently, conversations are still underway about the university's approach and plans for these students. We plan to roll out communication to all impacted students or potential students shortly, and we'll continue to keep the board apprised of any further developments in this area, including decisions for students entering beyond the fall of 2024. Since our last meeting, I've had the opportunity to travel to Southwest Florida, Palm Springs, and Phoenix, and the Phoenix area, tough duty, I admit, to speak with alumni and donors. Hey, that's where they are. <laughs> These were insightful and fruitful visits organized by Kathy Schmittelkoffer and her team at the University of Minnesota Foundation. I was excited to hear from many participation that our public outreach work over the past several months seemed to be generating renewed enthusiasm. They feel we are on a positive trajectory in terms of our mission and in terms of a public perception that deservedly matches our success. I also left all of these meetings struck by how much our alumni, donors, and friends value this great university. It's clear that our support extends deep and wide into the Sun Belt, and of course with our snowbirds who are there. That concludes my report, Chair Mayron. Thank you very much for your very substantive report. Really appreciate it in terms of everything you uh, provided us, but particularly talking about where you're, what you've accomplished with respect to the priorities that were set mutually between yourself and the board. Kudos to you, thank you very much. 
Turning to my report, I'd like to share a few updates. Uh, first, as uh, President Nettinger did, I want to acknowledge the tremendously positive reception that this board selection of Dr. Rebecca Cunningham has garnered across our campuses, in the media, in communications, and comments we've received, and in the halls of the Capitol in St. Paul. In fact, I attended a couple of the hearings that uh, President Ettinger uh, described, and both times the um, um, those on the committee from the uh, House or Senate called us out and had us stand up and introduce ourselves and thank mm -hmm. the regents who were present uh, there for being there and for our selection process and our outcome at the university. So lots of positive response uh, at the Hill, which is fantastic. Our process, as we all know and uh, take pride in, was thoughtful, permanent, transparent, and inclusive. And the outcome of the search has generated enthusiasm and optimism for the university's future and support for our decision. We have big opportunities ahead of us, and I know we are all looking forward to working with President-designate Cunningham in the months ahead. Later in our agenda, we will review and act on her employment agreement. It reflects her skill and experience as well as her strong desire to be here long term to help us deliver on our mission to this state and beyond. Second, I too would like to acknowledge the significant presence we had in St. Paul and have had. From the support at the U rally on the Capitol steps to legislative hearings to individual meetings and outreach, regents and senior leaders are stepping up our legislative engagement in a meaningful way. This is very important and I encourage us to continue to make it a priority. Our legislative request is vitally important to our mission. It will support students, invest in infrastructure, and secure our health sciences programs. And I urge all of us to advocate for it regularly in the months ahead. And I will tell you, having now attended several hearings, it's quite an educational experience but it's a good educational experience to hear from the legislators and to hear their questions and also how we respond to those questions, which has been outstanding. Third, in alignment with our board priority to propel the health sciences partnerships and strategies toward a clinical partnership plan that will champion medical education, improve clinical care, and more fully serve the people of Minnesota, the board engaged with faculty, staff, and students in the academic health sciences yesterday. I want to express gratitude for all the staff who were involved in making yesterday's events possible. From exploring the makerspace, to learning about the Bakken Medical Device Center, to touring the East Bank Hospital facilities and trying our hand at various virtual reality simulations, my colleagues and I learned a lot and were thoroughly engaged. The work being done with, within the six health sciences colleges to advance One Health is truly remarkable. And I will just comment on the virtual reality experience. We all got to try it, and uh, it's a good thing I'm not a doctor and was never trained as a doctor. If, if, well, I, if at some point, I couldn't even find my hand in the virtual reality. <laughs> and, and I don't know how many times my patient would have died if, yeah. I, was, if I was performing laparoscopic surgery. It was remarkable. <laughs> And finally, the board, speaking of virtual, the board's for virtual forum continues to be a valued source of input from the university community on a variety of manners, from the presidential search to general system-wide operations. As a reminder, the virtual forum, which is available on the board's website to gather video, audio, and written input from members of the university community, is being piloted through this spring. Since its launch in August, we've received over 100 comments. This input is valuable to my board colleagues and myself as we conduct our business. And that concludes my comments. So at this time, we will continue with our agenda. Item number four is to receive fi and file reports. We have several items reported in the docket materials. This includes a zero waste resolution prepared by members of the University of Minnesota Students for Climate Justice, a registered student organization. 
Pursuant to the board's bylaws, Article 6, Section E, the organizations requested an opportunity to address the board on this topic, and I have approved it. So at this time, I would like to invite undergraduate students, Maya Bowman and, oh boy, I hope I, Grace, Gracelyn uh, McClure to the presenter's table, Neil Seldman, also an expert from Zero Waste USA, is joining us via Zoom. I believe. Do we have Mr. Seldman there? I don't know, can you find out? We'll give him a moment to chime in here. Well, if we'll, we will make contact with him and hopefully he will be able to participate um, as we go. So at this time, I'm welcoming all three of you in anticipation Mr. Seldman will be here. As you know, you have five minutes for your remarks, which along with the resolution in the docket materials will serve as input to the board and administration. Just so you know, no action will be taken at this meeting. So with that, why don't you go ahead and proceed? Hello, Regents. Um, thank you for including us on the agenda today. Could you introduce yourself, by the way, so we know who's who? Thank you. Um, I'm Gracelyn McClure. Uh, my name is Maya Bowman. Um, we're undergraduate students and members of Students for Climate Justice at the University of Minnesota. We are here to speak to you today about the need for the University of Minnesota to develop a comprehensive zero waste plan. Currently, trash from the Twin Cities campus that is not diverted through recycling, composting, or other measures is sent to a garbage incinerator called the Hennepin Energy Recovery Center, or HERC. In part due to pollution from the HERC, neighborhoods near the incinerator have some of the highest asthma rates in the state. Because the university sends their trash to the HERC, it is playing an active role in harming these communities. We can do better. On the University of Minnesota Facilities Management website, it states that the long-term goal is to divert 90% of municipal solid waste from the HERC, but currently no plan or timeline exists to accomplish this goal. The University of Minnesota Sustainability Office and Sustainability Committee support the creation of a zero waste plan following their work on the 2050 Climate Action Plan, which you all approved. However, they have limited capacity and resources. The University of Minnesota has a multitude of resources that can be channeled to facilitate an expedited planning and implementation process, including the potential to create lots of jobs for the Twin Cities community. We urge the University of Minnesota to develop a zero waste plan with the active involvement of relevant department leaders, workers, students, and community members at every step of the process within one year and fully implement it by 2035. This plan should increase waste diversion rates to 75% by 2028 and to 90% by 2035 using a multifaceted approach of source reduction, diversion, and pushing for state and federal legislation to hold manufacturers accountable. We also encourage the university to cut ties with the HERC by January 1st, 2026. At a meeting last October, the county commissioners voted in favor of shutting down the HERC between 2028 and 2040. An exact shutdown date has not been set, but pressure from entities like the University of Minnesota could expedite this process, leading to immediate relief for the communities most affected by the HERC. The University of Minnesota has an opportunity to be a leader in zero waste, setting an example for campuses across the United States. You all have the opportunity to funnel university resources towards this change by including zero waste as a priority in the forthcoming strategic plan. Thank you. Are there any questions? I will open it up if anyone has some questions. I don't think you used your five, full five minutes, but uh, um, excellent report and excellent set of resolutions for us to consider. But let's open it up to questions. Regent Turner, did you raise your hand? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I, I want to express my appreciation of you all going through the process um, to come and address um, the Board of Regents. Um, as a bedside care nurse, I, I hear what you're saying as far as, the, um, you know, I work on a respiratory medical ICU. Um, and I just, I, I'm just so happy that you're here. 
and um, and that your um, to go about doing this in the effective way, coming to us with um, laid out plan. Um, it, I just appreciate I appreciate your efforts, and I'm just very delighted you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? Pardon? Go. Oh, uh, Regent Verhill. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I would also like to express my appreciation. I was in back listening before I came out here, and so I apologize I wasn't immediately sitting here when you were able to sit down and address the board. But I wanted to also express my appreciation for you taking the initiative to come through the Board of Regents process to make a request to Chair Mayron to address us, to bring forward a plan for us to consider and for us to talk about. Uh, as Chair of the Governance and Policy Committee, this. Uh, opportunities for input has been something that we've talked about extensively over the last few years and I really appreciate you bringing this forward in this way so that we can um, take this forward and and consider where we may incorporate these suggestions into future work plans or discussions especially as we talk with our chief sustainability officer and some of those opportunities as we look at campuses and, and really rethinking what we're doing at those campuses so thank you Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I would also echo my colleagues' comments um, about their appreciation. Um, and then I guess maybe in terms of moving forward, offer that um, we probably have some homework to do, obviously. And that's one of the fun parts of being a Regent. Yesterday you learned about laparoscopic surgery, and today we're talking about the HERC. But obviously it requires some time for us to um, you know, kind of get um, caught up on it. I see uh, our chief sustainability officer in the room, um, cheerleading, if you will. <laughs> um, that, that's my my description, <laughs> not his. But um, you know, I, and I think our next steps perhaps is to okay talk with him and, and administration, find out okay, um, you know, the, are those dates feasible? What are the next steps? What are those costs and whatnot? So maybe just an explanation of why we don't have much to say because it's like oh, okay well now let's let's find out but madam chair i'm sure we'll um communicate with the student group going forward but um i appreciate you guys being here yeah thank, thank you. you and our full zero waste resolution should be included in your um, report is. as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. yes uh regent ruth johnson and then we will conclude yeah. this segment okay just a quick comment uh and do you want to share the uh, appreciation for what you're doing and i think in the wake of our warmest winter ever and all the things that we're seeing about climate mm -hmm. that I hope that uh, the sense of urgency people feel will help us move this forward. We will take this up. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you, you very for much. bringing it to our attention. Next, we will consider the consent report. The consent report includes gifts, the report of the naming committee, and an employment agreement. I'll note that interim president Ettinger has recused himself from the portion of the gifts item related to the Hormel Foundation. So I bring that item forward with my own recommendation. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question, make a comment, or separate an item out from the report to be voted on separately before I invite a motion to recommend approval of the consent report? Regent Gulley. Chair, thank you so much. I would like to pull item C from the consent report to discuss separately. All right, and uh, just make sure item E is the- is Oh, C. I'm sorry. C, the employment C, agreement. the employment with... agreement. All right. Any other discussion or comments? All right, then um, is there a motion to cons approve the consent report minus the amended employment agreement, which we will take up separately? So moved. Is there a second? Seconded. Hearing, uh, is there any discussion on the balance of the consent report? All right, hearing none, if there are no uh, questions or comments, all those in favor of the consent report minus the employment agreement signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion is approved. Now, at this time, let's move on to the amended employment agreement for PJ Fleck. Before opening the floor for a presentation, is there a motion to approve the amended employment agreement? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Before we move to discussion, Interim President Ettinger, would you like to share some remarks? 
I would, and if we could also invite up Athletic Director Mark Coyle, and he'll follow me if that's okay. All right, thank uh, so you thank very you, much. Thank you, Chair Mayor Ron. Th this item is in regard to an amendment to the employment agreement for P.J. Fleck, head football coach for the Golden Gophers football team. <laughs> in light of the team's overall success under Coach Fleck, both on the field and in the classroom, I support the amendment as proposed. I have observed the positive impact Coach Fleck has on the student athletes on his team, and I believe this revised agreement, which puts Coach Fleck's compensation at the median of his Big Ten coaching peers, is fully appropriate. I will now turn this over to Mark Coyle, the Director of Athletics on the Twin Cities campus, for the details of the new agreement. All right, Athletic Director Coyle. Yeah, good Please morning, proceed. Chair Maron and members of the board and President Enger. Uh, just a couple of comments before we talk specifically about the, uh, the amended contract. I just would like to point out a few items. Uh, football funds 80% of our department. That percentage will continue to climb in future years. Football has spearheaded conference realignment with the Big Ten Conference and the Southeastern Conference. PJ has brought unprecedented attention to the university and to the state of Minnesota since his arrival. Minnesota has twice hosted ESPN College Game Day during his tenure and hosted Fox's pregame show to start the 2021 season. Prior to PJ, Minnesota had never hosted either one of these marquee college football shows, which serve as a multi-hour infomercial for the University of Minnesota. Each fall, the state of Minnesota does a give to the max day across the entire state. The university has raised $43.1 million since 2018. Of that, $28.7 million has been directed to Gopher Athletics, largely due to the success of Gopher football. Fleck has served as a commencement speaker at Minnesota graduations, and he and Heather support the M Health Fairview Masonic Children's Hospital through philanthropic funds and the Row the Boat Wall at the hospital. PJ co-instructed a seven-week course on leadership in the Carlson School of Management with Professor Teresa Glum. Academically, we are recording our highest grade point averages in school history with football. Minnesota has had nine academic All-America team members during his time. For context, from 1994 to 2015, Minnesota only had eight academic All-Americans. The 2024 football season will mark his eighth year leading our program. He already is fifth in program history for overall wins with 50, and we've won five straight bowl games under Coach Fleck, which is the nation's longest bowl winning streak, I believe. So again, we, um, thanks to the support of President Edinger, we had visited with PJ about an amendment to his contract where we added retention payments on at the end of the contract, which would be paid on December 31st of the year. Um, his base is at six million. First year will be 700 retention bonus. It'll escalate 100,000 each year. We also added $500,000 to our assistant coach salary pool, which is for our 10 assistant coaches. And as President Edinger mentioned, um, he would be at the mean or the average in the Big Ten Conference in pay. I think he went from 10th in pay to 9th in pay with this adjustment. So with that, Chair Marron, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, uh, Regent Gulley. Thank you, um, and thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Athletic Director Coyle. Um, I want to start by saying that I totally agree. Go for a football coach, and PJ Fleck in particular is hugely important to the university. Um, football is one of the biggest ways that people connect with the University of Minnesota. Um, called it our front porch um, for all of our sports, but in particular football. It's uh, you know, as you have so clearly stated, it's one of the biggest revenue builders for the university and for the athletic department. We're able to provide all kinds of athletic department activities and sports because of it. And so I completely agree with all of that. And I spent a lot of this week thinking about the fact that I'm here and I'm at the Capitol fighting for funding for so many things that matter so much to so many people in our university. Um, and make this university the amazing place that it is. Our people, who are our students, our staff, our faculty, our campuses and facilities, our graduate assistants are still negotiating their first contract and are getting into the tough work of negotiating economics right now um, and are being told that we may have less ability to even have graduate assistants because of what they're, you know, because of their organizing. Um, I realize we're making tough decisions all the time, but this is one of them. 
Uh, our adjuncts have never had an across the board raise as far as I know, and our lowest paid, ad paid adjuncts are still making less than $21 an hour. Um, not that we even know what that means because they don't get paid hourly. Um, yesterday, I was at the Capitol where we heard from an undergraduate student who shared that after a hard fought student led campaign, our uh, undergraduate work study students are still making less than the minimum wage in Minneapolis. D1 coach is a highly specialized role, and we pay our senior leader, our senior coaches uh, accordingly. And PJ Fleck is an asset to our university, and I sincerely hope that he stays for a very long time. And the rest of our campus community members cannot pay rent with love for the university. If they could, I would know. <laughs> um, and until our graduate assistants have a contract, until our adjuncts are getting paid enough to pay the loans that they took out to join us in those roles, until our students can pay for groceries and tuition, I cannot in good conscience vote for a million dollar raise for who, the person who is perhaps the single best paid person in the university. Um, I could be wrong, I didn't check. <laughs> but um, So it has nothing to do with PJ Fleck, who I think is a huge asset to our community, but I have to vote no. Thank you. Any comments that you wish to make? Okay, all right. Uh, Regent Hipsch. Um, thanks, Chair Maron. I don't disagree with a lot of what um, Regent Gauley has said about the wages of other employees and whatever else in the university, but I don't think we can pool these things together into the same category because if, um, let's say we lose PJ Fleck, let's go down that path it would do more damage than anything. And we won't be able to hit our goals on that side of it because our revenues would, would drop. He's done a great job. He's got a very public role. Every, every call he makes on the field is scrutinized by however many people are watching it. And if he makes the right decision, he's the smart man. If he doesn't, he's in the papers. You know, and so we just have to remember that uh, what he's done for the program and winning isn't linear. And losing isn't linear either. But I know with the transfer portal, portal and NIL, if we would lose somebody that's a great coach, we would be in huge trouble. It would be six more years of bailing out of that. So uh, I think the best decision is to keep the good people we have into uh, a continuous cycle of improvement. So anyway, I, I hear what you're saying, though. I, I do. So thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I can look at this from both sides, and as a, um, you know, what I what I do in life, and and being on the front lines, and being up at the Capitol, and um, fighting for leaky roofs to get fixed, and elevators, and our five hundred million, you know, heaper uh, that we want. It's. Um, to make this kind of decision when we're asking at the Capitol for 500 million to be able to fix our campuses, it's a little bit of a ugh, kind of thing. But I do have I do have a question for you: Is it the rest of our athletics? Is it supported because of our sports? Like I'm new to all of this, so supported by football and basketball, basketball and hockey and things like that. Um, just give me a little insight just how important it is to have a sport that generates funds and what does it mean to the other sports this is why i have a this is why i have a quandary about it my heart tells me that yes this is outrageous that higher ed is getting to this point that it's almost becoming i'm used to working in corporate healthcare now this seems like corporate higher ed and it and it totally goes against everything that I have stood for um, over the last decade and a half. But we have to also deal with reality. So if you could answer my question about, you know, just what does it mean to our other um, sports? Yeah, uh, Chair Mayron and, yes. and uh, Regent Turner, thank you for the question. I, I guess a couple of comments. As, as I said before, football funds eighty percent of our department. Yeah. We have 22 programs, over 600 student athletes, uh, grade point average of a 3.46, our highest we've ever had, having great, great success across all 22 sports. But we have three sports that support all those programs, football, men's basketball, and men's hockey. And so when we look at our football position, um, college athletics is going through seismic shifts right now. It is all driven by football. 
We're having record attendance at our football stadium. The five bowl games that PJ's taken us to that we've won, including the Outback Bowl, uh, all that generates millions of dollars for our program that supports our cross-country team, our gymnastics team, our swimming and diving program. And, um, you know, to, to Regent Hip's point and, and Regent Goley, I appreciate your comments and understand where you're coming from. And you've been a great advocate for our student athletes. So thank you for that. I appreciate your comments very much. With the transfer portal, with NIL, if you go through a coaching transition right now, you're going to lose unbelievable amount of kids. And it's a complete rebuild. And so for us to continue to fund all 22 programs, we need a healthy foot pro football program. It, yes, Regent Turner. Thank you. Explain to me how, why, I, I'm very ignorant on all of this. Why, how, why do you lose the kids? If the, what, what happens with that? Uh, Chair Mayer yes. and, and, and Regent Hips, um, our coaches are recruiting these kids for years and years okay. uh, when they're in high school, right? And a lot of times when you see a program go through a coaching transition, uh, student athletes leave. And, and, uh, and I, and I want to be careful. I, I, uh, I, have, I have read through the media, with all due respect to the media, I have read media reports. The University of Washington played in the national championship game this year against Michigan. Okay? They lost that game. Their coach left and went to the University of Alabama. I think Washington has one kid coming back from their two deep of their starters. It's a complete overhaul. So when you lose a coach, you lose, and it's in any sport, it, you lose a head coach, there's going to be transition, and uh, we would most definitely take a step backward. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair Mayron, and thank you, um, um, Director Coyle. Um, you know, this is a tough one, and I really appreciate, too, uh, what Regent Gully has said about the juxtaposition between this and other positions at the university. Um, and, that, and it's hard um, to, to swallow that in terms of the relationship between the two. That said, you know, I just have to say I believe the market is the market. And we have to basically decide whether we want Division One athletics or not, because football, so it, all the other athletics de are dependent upon that. And then I do appreciate um, um, Athletic Director Coyle, the, the performance on the off field with the academic performance, the challenges with NIL and the portal that are coming through, the disruptions that this would create. And so with all of the context in mind and with some of the challenges with that, uh, I will vote in favor of uh, extending this contract with these provisions. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? I will just make a quick comment, and it's piggybacking on what Regent Wheeler said. But I, I, I do believe if we don't want to be in athletics, then don't be in athletics. But if we're going to be in athletics, then we have to support it adequately. And that means supporting the football program, which is the substantial contributor to all of the other athletic support uh, teams uh, that we have here. So I, I think making a decision not to approve this contract and losing, likely losing PJ uh, at some point, um, I think would be devastating to our athletic program and how we fund the other programs. So I think it, it means a fundamental decision about whether you want to stay in athletics, varsity athletics, in D, uh, Division I athletics, or you don't. But I don't think we get it both ways. The other piece I would observe is uh, this is not coming out of the university's budget, this increase. This is coming out of the athletic department's budget. They're the ones who are going to have to make this work. And so while I, too, greatly appreciate Regent Gully's comments about wages and compensation across the board for our university employees, staff, faculty, students, I think we're trying to marry together apples and oranges. And um, the good news for us is this is not coming out or not impacting what we're doing on the academic and research mission. This comes out of the athletic department's budget. They've got to make it work. And so for all those reasons, I will be supporting this as well. Anything further? 
I'm sorry. Uh, yes, <laughs> Regent Tarabi. Thanks, Chair Mayron. Um, I too just want to echo what you just said, which is really about the separation of the athletics and the university budgets. That that is really crucial, and how important it is for us to retain um, a coach that I think has done a significant. Um, uh, amount of things to bring positivity to the university and having longevity is really crucial. Um, having been to those sports events, um, I've never been to so many football games, <laughs> um, but uh, just to um, see the, the the number of people who get excited and um, feel excited um, about the, the um, university, I just feel like that's something that we we, we can't even get um, on uh, other kinds of marketing. So um, I think that gives me reassurance. And I want to really acknowledge what uh, Regent Gali is saying, that those are really important things that we have to work through on the university budget. and to um, But to also uh, understand that um, our, these are two separate budgets, and it's really important for us to um, uh, maintain and do our very best for athletics as well. So I, too, will be supporting the contract. All right, Regent Kenyanya, you want to yeah. bring us home? Here? I will bring it home, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for thanks for the conversation, Director Coyle. You know, thanks for being here, Regent Gully, for really raising the conversation. It, it's good that we're having it. Um, Regent Turner kind of voiced my mental dialogue and, and kind of that quandary. I mean, I think a lot of us find ourselves in the same place. Um, and for the reasons um, I, for the reasons explained by Director Coyle, you know, I'll be able to support the contract. Um, I did just want to note, I mean, just on that last piece of dialogue between the chair and Regent Taurabe, um, athletics is not a perfect auxiliary in terms of it is a separate um, budget, but there are some university funds, I think it was around seven million, somewhere in that neighborhood that do support athletics. So at least wanted to note that. Director Coyle will tell you truthfully that there's very few universities that don't have uh, some of that. There, there, there's probably a handful in the country that are actually net positive overall. So I know that's not an easy place to get to. And I know that is the North Star and you'd love to be sending a check um, over to, to O&M. Um, and so um, just wanted to note that out there. I think that's our aspiration. You know, hopefully we can get there one day. And I think the competitiveness is, is actually what helps you, you know, get to that point. But did want to distinguish that um, budgets are separate, but not 100%. Uh, there are some o &M support over there, but I'll be able to support it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Anything further? Anything further? Athletic Director Coyle. No, thank you, Chair Mara. All right. Then, uh, hearing no uh, more discussion, uh, then all those in favor of the amended, FLEC amended employment agreement, please say aye. 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 All those, <clears throat> aye, too. <laughs> all those opposed? No. No. All right. Then the uh, motion carries 10, 10 approve and uh, two said no. That's, that's my count. All right. Thank you very much. Then at this time, um, let's see what time we are here. Uh, what I'd like to, let's hear from our student representatives and then we will take a break. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Flora Yang and Hal Johnson, Chair and Vice Chair of the Student Representatives to the Board of Regents respectively. Thank you both. And uh, before you make your comments, I, I just want to tell you that your video presentation, how you presented this and, and the topics that you're bringing forward to us was outstanding. Um, yes. This is a pilot for us to think about whether we begin to do this with other presentations by senior administrators as to whether we should talk about doing this. You have just exemplified how this can work and not to mention that the substance of it was very compelling. So I want to thank you and, and say kudos to everyone who worked with you to bring this forward to us. So with that, um, Student Representatives Yang and Johnson, um, take it away. Thank you so much for those comments, um, Chair Mehran. And good morning, Chair Mehran and members of the board. 
Um, as you know, over the past few months, eight student representatives across all five system campuses have worked together to articulate the stories and concerns of our students. And so today, we look to your leadership as the Board of Regents and the highest governing entity at the university to acknowledge both the successes and the areas of improvement of the university, as well as collaborate with students to address these issues. After four years, actually, of working with the board in various capacities, I'm really excited to be here today to represent the voices of students during this 2024 report. Before we start, I'd like to just thank all the work that Hal and all of our other student representatives put into making this video and this subsequent presentation, as well as all of you for taking the time to listen to us and engage with the video and presentation. So this year, as all of you know, instead of a written report, the student representatives have opted to film a 15-minute video that articulates the aspirations, concerns, and priorities of our diverse student population for three particular topics. Hal and I are here today as the chair and vice chair of the student representatives to provide an overview of this video and highlight key recommendations regarding basic needs, mental health, and community and belonging. For the past several years, the student representatives have written extensive and comprehensive reports using various university-specific statistics to showcase areas of improvement on each campus. Since last year's audit report, st audit style report gave a comprehensive overview of many different factors impacting student life, the regions are acutely aware of the progress made on both the governance and administrative levels. Therefore, instead of another written report with similar statistics, we chose to create a video with the goal of adding more value and insight to your current understanding of the student experience. This video, this video was designed to, one, showcase and empower student voices by creating a platform in which they can provide direct feedback to all of you as the Board of Regents, two, to visualize and acknowledge the wins of student and administrative collaboration, and lastly, to identify recommendations and put faces to the changes that are needed. We'd also like to thank the efforts of Sang Ho, a UMN second year law student who served as our editor and videographer for the video. I would like to start our discussion about basic needs off with some context regarding the Twin Cities basic needs strategic plan. In 2019, Boynton Health completed a student food and housing insecurity needs assessment focused on the Twin Cities campus. And I'm sure all of you know much has changed for student basic needs since, especially with the occurrence of the global pandemic. And there was a need to document the changes and the progress that has been made towards addressing these issues. This is why last year I advocated for the Office of Student Affairs to bring together various stakeholders to accomplish this task. And so starting in November of 2022, on behalf of Student Affairs and in collaboration with dozens of campus co partners, Michaela Robertson and Karen Onerheim of Boynton led a committee to reassess current university strategy and efforts to identify gaps and potential basic needs opportunities that includes but is not limited to food and housing insecurity. Through these efforts, the committee was able to make 14 Twin Cities specific recommendations, some of which have already been successfully implemented, while others are still a work in progress. We want to acknowledge that each campus is different, and members of each campus have been working diligently together to meet the needs of students. However, like we articulated in the video, there are still gaps to be identified, acknowledged, and addressed. And so just like how PRISM brought together a centralized committee for folks from each campus to address system-wide concerns and issues regarding mental health, the student rep representatives recommend the board, one, call for the development of a working group to assess the state of base student basic needs system-wide, two, to incorporate basic needs into long-term strategic planning, such as in our next impact plan, 
And three, to keep basic needs at the forefront of decision making when reevaluating space and other budgetary allocations. So, with Impact 2025 closing in on its final year, now is the time for us to discuss, plan, and act. The student representatives acknowledge that the university has committed itself to the President's Initiative for Student Mental Health, also known as PRISM, uh, within the scope of its Impact 2025 goals. During its fruition, PRISM has offered seed grants to investigate causes, antecedents, and risk factors for mental health problems, expand mental health services system-wide by creating an internal network of telehealth therapists, and discuss ex the expansion of the Mental Health Advocates Program to Crookston, Duluth, and Rochester in 2024. These are important steps in bridging gaps in mental health resources and awareness across all five campuses. Therefore, the student representatives would like to recommend that the university provide continued support for PRISM beyond Impact 2025. Each campus has access to different resources and have unique gaps regarding these mental health resources. Currently, each campus is working to identify more areas of potential improvement. Once these areas are identified and brought to the attention of administrators, we need to be on board and prepared to fill these gaps effectively and efficiently. Therefore, we recommend that the university commit further resources to bridge these gaps in mental health as identified by mental health services on each campus. The student representatives also recommend that the university make an institutional commitment to becoming a health promoting university by adopting the Okanagan, Okanagan Charter. The charter has two primary calls to action. One, embed health into all aspects of campus culture across administration, operations, and academic mandates. And two, lead health promotion action and collaboration locally and globally. This charter outlines how health can be embedded in policy and activities and it emphasizes a whole health approach. This includes mental health and well being and would be an important commitment for the university regarding mental health. It emphasizes the role of higher education it has in promoting health and engaging the student voice in the wider scope of health and health education. And the university has the opportunity to participate in a large scale commitment to public health by doing so. There are currently 231 institutions in the U.S. Health Promoting Campuses Network that are currently working toward adopting this charter, including eight Big Ten schools. We strongly urge the university to join this movement. While community and belonging are noted as, key, as a key commitment within Impact 2025, there are currently some notable gaps in the metrics being collected. At the moment, there is an annual climate survey that collects data on students' sense of community and belonging on the Twin Cities campus. While this survey has shown a fairly impressive 88% community and belonging for TC students, we lack similar data connected to Impact 2025 that addresses this on our system campuses. We cannot rely solely on the metrics of the Twin Cities to determine whether we are meeting goals regarding a sense of belonging and community. When each campus is different, and has different cultures and challenges that need to be addressed. Therefore, we urge the establishment of system-wide goals and metrics regarding community and belonging within long-term strategic planning. As we have found with the production of this video, students rely on student-centered spaces, events, and organizations to find a community on their respective campuses. These spaces are vital to student culture and promote a variety of connections and opportunities that may otherwise be unavailable to students. It is important to make sure these spaces are accessible and work for the students that they are meant to serve. Each campus has its own set of accessibility challenges and it is important that they are addressed to continue to promote the creation of communities for all students. When allocating budgets and making decisions regarding real estate, we highly recommend the board keep student spaces and student accessibility at the forefront. In closing, we want to extend our sincere gratitude to numerous parties, the students who offered their testimonials, the faculty and staff who provided us with relevant information, the staff members to the board for assisting with logistics, as well as each and every one of you for your engagement with the video and your dedication to the pursuit of student success. As student representatives, it is our role to serve as the bridge between the student body and all of you. 
In this slide, we have articulated some questions from students to the Board of Regents to facilitate our discussion. We're excited to gather even more feedback um, of your feedback on the video as well as answer any outstanding questions. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again. I just had to get educated by my colleague to the right of what R2 RS meant, and that's <laughs> reps to the regents, I understand. Oh. So, <laughs> yesterday it was trying to learn medical terms, today it's oh. trying to learn these terms as well. Uh, outstanding presentation, I already said outstanding video, and I will personally say I think everything that you brought to our attention, the timing is perfect as we uh, we'll be uh, welcoming our new president and doing our, start, uh, our strategic planning this summer at the summer retreat. Couldn't be more timely in terms of what you are requesting. So um, I think this is a great report um, and great requests for us to consider uh, as we go forward. And with that, let me open it up to any questions or comments by my colleagues. Yes, Regent Verhalen. Yeah, Chair Mayron, student representatives, thank you so much for putting this in a video context that we can also share with other people. So one of the things that I've struggled with the last couple of years as a regent is after we get these really helpful updates from the student representatives, carrying it forward to others because trying to, for me to try and communicate the passion and the personal experiences that you all have in making these recommendations is challenging. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how long it's been since I've been out of undergrad, but it's long enough. And being able to have this video to show individuals as I'm interacting with them, legislators, parents, donors, et cetera, is really valuable because we need all of their support to bring some of these things to fruition and move them forward and move the ball. Um, and I really appreciated the thoughtfulness in looking at PRISM and how it can be carried forward into the other campuses and filling some of those gaps, as you identified, um, that are there and how do we do that. But you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we also have to be very honest in that, OK, we've started. Now, what's the next step? And where do we take it? And how do we carry it forward? And it's not something that just falls off the plate because it was an impact 2025 goal, and it's almost 2025. So I really appreciate having this medium to be able to share with other people. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Regent Turner. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I just want to highlight one of your needs that I, when I visited you all for your forum with your undergrad student government, did I get that right, mm -hmm. USG? Okay. Um, is the fact that um, food insecurity, that we need, we need a grocery store. And the fact that a space that um, could have been a grocery store actually used to be a grocery store. I understand it used to be a red owl. I know you don't know that, but in the 60s, Red Owl was big. <laughs> but anyway, and it's a, and it's a, I remember Red Owl. Here we go. All right, see, we're same generation. Right yep. But anyway, um, and the fact that it's a liquor store instead of a, a grocery store was, is very alarming for me. Um, and so, and I, I've kind of said, I'd love to come to that committee that you have for the, the grocery store, because that, is, that was what I heard that day as your number one concern is to have food so that you could eat and think and get through school. It's just basic need that I really heard, and I hope we can find a way to make that happen somehow. Other comments? Yes, Regent Tarada. Um, thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you um, both to the students and for, <clears throat> again, uh, just echoing my uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for the video. That was really um, terrific. And it was just so nice to see so many students um, as a part of the video. So um, I know it took a lot of work, and I just want to thank you guys for doing that, too. Um, I think my notice, um, again, 
the recommendations are really timely, but I also really appreciated um, how you all were able to help us to think about the systemness. <laughs> I know that that is something that we're all working towards, and so the your clear communication about what works where, and then also how we elevate it across the different campuses is really important, and I think it's just something to note as we walk into the next strategic plan. Um, to hear about that, but also to remind ourselves about what students really feel are um, the baselines of what we should have of all across our system to ensure that our students are able to um, live and go to school and feel like they belong and um, are, are, are part of um, this university. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I also just want to add my thanks and appreciation to our student representatives for this great report. Um, similar to what Regent Verhalen said, having this medium of a video to be able to use that to communicate student priorities to different constituencies, I think is going to be really helpful in moving the ball forward on some of these top priorities for students. Um, to what Regent Turner said, we've been talking about a grocery store um, on campus mm -hmm. since I know I was involved as a student in conversations in 2016 in 2017 about that. So I think that's a priority that we clearly need to continue to move forward. And then um, seeing, I don't know, I don't have the stat on top of my head, but I know that uh, mental health has been a consistent theme in the student representative reports for a long time. And so I wanted to call that out. Uh, we've obviously made progress as an institution with PRISM and other things, but uh, seeing consistent themes, I think being brought forward from R to R's is something to note and something that we should continue to work towards and um, yeah, just really impressed again overall with um, the new innovative um, way that this report was brought forward. It's way better than the Kenyanya student representative report of 2019. Oh, <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it's great and um, I really appreciate the work and uh, thanks for the presentation today. Uh, well, you're next on the list, Regent <laughs> Kenyanya. <laughs> You must have anticipated you were going to get no, I, 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 I can't say that I did, but I hope you're enjoying your vacation, Regent Farnsworth. I see you're in good spirits. <laughs> we, shall, we shall speak privately. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you for the report. Um, trying the new format, absolutely. I mean, um, just trying it. I mean, you know, maybe we decide that's not the right avenue, but, you know, I do like the format. I'd also encourage, um, you know, all really members of administration to take a look at those videos because, you know, a lot of the issues we discuss um, are handled at different levels um, of the university, right, and are handled by different folks. So I think everyone could benefit from taking a look at that. Um, I think Regent Taliyarabe talked about the systemness, system-wideness, and student government has certainly been an example um, of that. And, and that even that's evolved um, over time you know, Regent Farnsworth alluded to my time in that uh, around 2015, we saw other student governments as competition. I mean, that's really how it was. And that started to evolve where it's like, well, we actually have way more in common in a lot of the same issues. And that approach has not only continued, it's, it's actually gotten better um, and stronger. And, and I think there's a genuineness to it that, you know, we can we can adopt it. Other areas of the institution. The other thing that the videos showed is that students are um, are different. Um, that sounds obvious, but, but I mean, obviously by campus, but then also we had the COGS report and the PSG report, and those are different experiences, being a graduate student versus undergraduate, professional student. I visited with the Council of Graduate Students Forum maybe three weeks ago, um, and they helped me realize something I knew, but you know, it really got pointed that um, you know, I haven't been a graduate student, and and there's and I think when we talk about students, the default is undergraduate. Um, not always. I know it is for me, um, but there's there's just some things that are different that we have to be aware of and and think between campuses and also between levels. So I, I appreciate that the video kind of delineated those, but at the same time, there's all these issues that are different between those levels, and then there's ones that are the same, whether you're talking to a graduate student or an undergraduate student, the basic needs stuff, mm -hmm. that's pretty consistent, you know, um, across those levels. You know, basic needs is a, um, 
it's a more trickier conversation because because it's it encompasses a lot and there's no like single policy like let's change this policy and then we'll have addressed that or same with mental health same with a lot of these larger initiatives we bring compared to other other okay we're trying to change this academic policy to change this thing for students right it's a little different with this and there's so many people involved and the the video also highlighted the good work being done in the food pantries and and things like that but you know obviously not uh enough i agree with my colleagues you know that um, much like, you know, prior advocacy, I, th I think the big ones that stick out are sexual misconduct. That started with the students, became a university. And it was always there, but became, you know, a big university initiative. Mental health became a big focus. And I, and I think we've kind of identified, possibly, in my opinion, the, the, you know, the next one, the next area. Um, and uh, Regent Turner kind of um, described how important i mean it's food you know i mean how how can you you know how can you do anything else if, if you don't have um some of those basic needs so I, i'm looking forward to continuing the conversation throughout retreat and, and beyond and with the with the in partnership with the current and, and next administration and also i mean i think the university i've said it before we don't there's a lot of things we don't control around campus and outside of campus but we do have influence um, and that doesn't mean we can, um, and this is speaking specifically of the Twin Cities campus, for example, that doesn't mean we can just put a grocery store tomorrow, but we do have influence over mm -hmm. um, that and, and, and we can flex that and it may take time, but um, I, yeah, I appreciate it. And I think, um, I, I think we may have found the, the, the next focus. So thank you. Thank you. I just wanna share two things as well. One, your emphasis on systemness is critical. It's a, um, it, it permeated the discussions that we had with the candidates for our next president. I think there is high commitment to uh, working with the University of Minnesota as a system as opposed to the individual campuses. So you're pointing out that there were certain metrics that applied only to Twin City campus and not to the others is right on and and i think that will that was an excellent point to make with us um and the last thing is your last question there it was very intriguing to me now that i know what r2 rs is <laughs> and it's not r2d2 so okay um i want to turn that question around which is um it, the the nature of the question is suggesting there is a gap between the student body and the board and you are looking for suggestions about how to improve your roles as representatives to the board here. Do you have, if you wanna talk about the gap, but I'm also very interested in what you would suggest if you're seeing that there is a gap, what you think would better enhance your connection to the board. Yes, I can start with this question. Thank you so much, um, Chair Mayeron and members of the board for all of you for your question and also for all of your comments. I'm really excited that the video was well received. Um, so for context re regarding this question, it was more talking about the idea of how it's very two, it's very, it's, it's double-sided. So not only are students sort of expecting, you know, the Board of Regents to interact with all of us, we also want to meet all of you in the middle and sort of articulate ways in which we can help facilitate discussions and facilitate um, conversations. And so, like I mentioned during the presentation, our role as the student representatives to the Board of Regents, or R to R's for short, um, is really to fill that the gap, as in sort of the um, the the to be the bridge between the student body and the board. And one of the ways that we have identified as R to R's this year of how we can do that is to sort of create and develop this video so that you can see instead of you know thousands of words on a written report uh, on a 60 page written report that you can actually see you know faces of students who are articulating their concerns directly to all of you um, during the video so that was sort of the context and the intent behind the question and we were just curious also as student representatives if all of you had any ideas for us beyond you know our new novel idea of the video of how we can better sort of facilitate those conversations with all of you in the future. 
I'd also thank you, Chair Mayron and members of the board. I'd also like to add, um, as someone from a system campus, and it's really nice to hear the emphasis in your conversations about systemness. It's definitely easy as a system campus to sometimes feel a bit distanced from the board because a lot of conversations do sort of feel Twin Cities focused. And so um, just kind of knowing, I guess, that you're discussing systemness more and more and considering the system as a whole more and more is really, um, it, it, it definitely helps me feel a little, like the gap is being bridged just by doing that, so. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, with that, um, we will take a recess for 10 minutes and then we will resume okay. this board meeting.
I'm listening. You have to get that large grade. Thank you. We will resume today's board of di directors meeting, board of regents meeting. And at this time, we will hear an update on ongoing safety efforts at the University of Minnesota. Interim President Ettinger and Police Chief Clark, would you like to get us started? Thank you very much, Chair Mayron. There's Chief Clark. Chief Clark is heading up. Great. When I became interim president last June, I was well aware of public safety concerns from our students, staff, faculty, and visitors. It's an issue that many campuses face, but it's also an issue that's nuanced and frankly more complicated for our Twin Cities campus, being embedded in a large metro area and with law enforcement handled by multiple jurisdictions. Ensuring public safety on or near our campuses has been one of my highest priorities as agreed upon with this board last July, and I've been engaged with these efforts since summer. I've attended public safety meetings, worked closely with Chief Clark on both immediate matters and longer term initiatives, and had an opportunity to participate in a safety walk in Dinky Town this last fall. Despite all our best efforts, occasionally there are incidents of concern on or near campus that affect our students and our greater community. But I'd like to thank all of our teams who work tirelessly to make our campuses safe. Chief Clark and our U of M Public Safety Department deserve a special thanks for their efforts, which have included a lot of overtime for public safety officers. Now I'd like to hand this over to Chief Clark for a recap on the 2023 crime statistics, 2023 successes, and infrastructure investments that we've made using our one-time funding from the state, and also a look at some initiatives for this spring. Chief Clark. Thank you. President Edger, Madam Chair and Regents. Um, as the President said, I'll be discussing campus safety, Dinky Town safety and uh, safety initiatives for 2024. Uh, to start off, we're <clears throat> discussing violent crime. There is a slight increase in 2023 from 2022 with 31 events as opposed to 23 last year. A few of the details we should discuss related to violent crime on campus is that half or 16 incidents were related to criminal sexual conduct. And in those cases, uh, all but one were known suspects. Additionally, we had an increase in aggravated assault from six to eight events in 2023 and robbery from four to seven events in 2023. Uh, it would be better if we were at zero for campus crime, it's what we strive to achieve. But that, are, that is still a relatively low number considering the number of people and the space we occupy between St. Paul and Minneapolis. What is also important in the details is that 58% of our cases are successfully investigated and presented to charges to the county attorney's office. Another 16% are currently under investigation, meaning that the vast majority of our cases are not only being investigated, but the suspects are being identified and when applicable charges are being presented on those cases. One of my philosophies always has been that to interrupt crime, you need to identify the suspects, investigate it thoroughly, and charge individual criminals to reduce crime overall. One of our highest areas of crime incidents is theft on campus, as you can imagine. Uh, we had an 8% reduction of theft on campus uh, for 412 events in 2023 as opposed to 450 in 2022. Our pre-pandemic number for theft on campus was 577 events. So in comparison, we're still holding thefts at a low level. I'd like to thank Director Jeff Lassard with our 911 Center and Security Data and Access Team. They worked hard over the summer to work with building representatives to secure buildings so that they are UCARD access only or to limit hours so there's less opportunity for thieves to take uh, different items from our buildings. Additionally, I'd like to thank University of Security. They work overnights, walking through our buildings, checking IDs, securing doors and windows, and they are the unsung heroes of building security on campus. In terms of burglary, uh, another area we always examine, we had 42 incidents on the campus with 33 last year. Um, 
What's important with that number is that it was much higher. It was 50 of the burglary incidents in 2019. <coughs> We've seen a reduction overall, but a slight increase from last year to this year. I know our building security work helps to keep that number down, but also successful investigations, which we have had, identifying burglary suspects and having them charged in 2023. Chief Clark, I just have a quick question for us as you give us those statistics. Can you describe what's the difference between a theft and a burglary? Yeah. Madam Chair, yes, I can. So a theft would be um, when a person is in an area that is open to the public, like the rec center, student union, other places where you can be. You steal somebody's backpack, which is commonly done, or somebody goes to the bathroom or leaves their items, their school items, their laptop on a desk or someplace in a library, that's a theft. Uh, committing a burglary is usually in an occupied dwelling, a place where somebody lives. Okay. Uh, one of our main areas is radius. We had a few events there where we identified a suspect related to those burglaries because those, that's an occupied dwelling. That also applies to our housing and residential life area where our students are living there. If you steal from somebody's dorm room, that would be a burglary. Okay. Thank you. In terms of auto theft, we have seen an increase um, from 2021, where we had 41 events. In 22 and 23, we had just over 60. We know this is a metro issue, and we are trying to keep that number down. Our surrounding neighborhoods have had a dramatic increase in auto theft. There's two specific strategies we've employed through 2023 to deal with that. First is we have 10 license plate readers on campus. Those license plate readers read license plates from vehicles that pass by and they're run through the state. Hot sheet is what it's called to determine if the vehicle's stolen. Then our officers respond to that area. We know people driving stolen vehicles will often commit a robbery or steal another vehicle in the area. So we do try to intercept those individuals when they are determined to be driving a stolen motor vehicle. Secondarily, I met with the Hennepin Chiefs Association yesterday. Uh, Sheriff Dewana Witt has state funding for specific auto theft enforcement and investigation, and we will partner with the sheriff and the Minneapolis police chief to work on auto theft, specifically in the area of juvenile auto theft. We know that many of our auto theft incidents relate to juveniles, and we want to make sure we're teaming up with uh, Sheriff, Minneapolis Chief, and other partners in the Metro. Switching to Dinkytown violent crime, there is good news there. We saw about a 60% reduction over the last two years in violent crime. Overall, we had 87 incidents of violent crime in 2021, 66 events in 2022, and 28 events in 2023. <clears throat> that number specifically, uh, was driven by robbery. Uh, two years ago in 21, there were 64 robberies in Dinkytown, 44 in 2022, and only 12 in 2023. Additionally, we saw a small reduction in aggravated assault. I think the work that UMPD did with Minneapolis, with the Sheriff's Office, with community engagement and safety education did help in Dinkytown to reduce that number. And we believe that, that, that we'll continue to do that work in Dinkytown through the rest of this year. One thing of note is that statistics in Dinkytown relate to our analysis of crime on and off campus based on the 90 plus percent occupancy of students. When we get into other neighborhoods, I know there's discussion about the level of crime. The demographic is definitely different. It's more <coughs> Minneapolis resident based and less university. We do work with the Minneapolis on examining <coughs> the surrounding neighborhoods, but it is less uh, of a focus for us than Dinky Town based on the demographics. I think it's important to discuss our overtime as well. President Edinger met, mentioned that. We've had two officers in Dinky Town every night for the last two years and more on the weekends. We also were asked to help the transit police department. Um, and we have two shifts every day on the transit lines uh, at the request not only of the transit police department, but also our students in a survey last year, increasing safety on the transit lines. We also are trying to fill supplemental shifts on campus to ensure that we're not working more in areas more uh, 
off campus than we are on campus and that we're responding to calls as quickly as possible. We all do it. I do it myself working overtime with our officers at night and they are dedicated, but we, this relates to our initiatives in 2024. We are stretched pretty thin in terms of our personnel and the amount we're going to work. Finally, um, in terms of our staffing and our response, there were 20,990 calls that we responded to on and off campus. The majority of those were 911 calls, but much of it was also uh, proactive patrols, um, enforcement, et cetera. 10% uh, of that 20,999 service-related calls were off campus, and 43% of that 10% was in Dinkytown specifically. So as you can see, we are putting a number of uh, investments off campus, but our core responsibility is campus. <laughs> Currently, we have 58 officers. That's up from 46 two years ago when I reported to you last on our staffing numbers, and we are auth authorized for 73 police officers. We're at about 31 security personnel, and we're authorized for 41. So we are trending in the right direction, but we are not fully staffed at this point. On to our initiatives for 2024. There's four specific initiatives. The first is a Safe You communications review. We have an independent evaluator looking at how we send Safe You communications, our safety communications, and comparing that with other universities, our size, and also in the Big Ten. We're hoping to get the final report in the next coming months uh, as they finish up their interviews. Project 500 is an initiative we've been working on in 2023 and into 2024. As President Edinger stated, this is part of our state funding and part of what was created by former SVP Franz, the Security Infrastructure Group that is chaired by Public Safety and by uh, the Office of Information Technology. What we do with that group is we coordinate across all system campuses to align camera and access control to ensure that all of our systems, our enterprise security systems, are operating uh, in the right way. We've had 90 plus projects last year, using up most of the $4 million from the state on four basic areas, and we'll do the same in 2024. Those areas are ensuring that all end of life networking systems are replaced. Uh, that's the critical piece to make sure that our cameras and the networks are working correctly making sure there's no network issues and the software is working correctly as well across all system campuses. We added blue phones and put them in strategic areas across all five campuses to ensure we had a clear view of each of our campuses. And then we also added and fixed our access control for all five of the campuses. We call it Project 500 because we have about 450 to 460 buildings, but we thought we'd round up and just call it Project 500. <laughs> To make it simple, our goals with Project 500 are really three specific areas. We know that emergency responders and others need a clear view of all of our campuses with our camera system. We also know it is a standard for many universities to lock buildings and the majority of the buildings when there's an emergency to keep people safe. Those two areas we're working on and investing that $4 million into those two priorities. Lastly, uh, with Project 500, we want to move into securing individual classrooms with automated locks when we need to. We know that that's probably not going to happen for all of our classrooms across the five campuses, but we are looking at an alternative, which is a manual lock for some of the classrooms for TAs and professors if there is an emergency outside the classroom. Uh, in my meetings with Big Ten chiefs and with other professionals, other universities, those are the three areas that we really want to focus on to secure our campuses. And we will need some future support and funding to complete that project by funding. The next project is our mutual aid um, expansion with MPD. Um, we have been providing life safety response to calls, which we call priority one calls for a number of years. And that means if anybody in our surrounding neighborhoods uh, have a life safety incident, 
We will be there to respond if MPD cannot take those calls. I've met with the Minneapolis police chief, and they do have a limited capacity to handle all other 911 calls in our surrounding neighborhoods. Many of our campus community <coughs> folks are waiting a long time to get a response from MPD based on historic low numbers, the Minneapolis Police Department. And I've talked with the Minneapolis chief, Chief O'Hara, about expanding our response to 911 calls to those lower priority calls. One of the items we're discussing today, and we're getting feedback from other university members on, is taking all 911 calls in a specific area off campus. That would be University Avenue to 4th and 35W to 19th Avenue Southeast. That is a very specific area for the university. We have a lot of Greek life there. We um, residents, we have a lot of uh, student housing as well. And we do have university infrastructure with scattered within that 10 block area. Um, the discussion for this group and, uh, and with the president has been, how much do we do and how far do we take it? Uh, I believe that it is a good thing that we're responding to some of those lower priority calls when our university folks off campus need that help. And considering the amount of overtime and the staffing levels, I don't know that we could do much more than that. But I think it's, um, in my discussions with department members, we feel like it's something we should do, and it's a responsibility we should take on. Uh, the second uh, item for 2024 would be our campus off-campus safety center. The idea behind that is investing more in an area of Dinky Town that has uh, safety issues. As we discussed, there's a reduction in crime, but there is also a need to increase our safety education, resources, and engagement in Dinky Town. To do that, we believe a off-campus safety center would be a valuable resource for the campus community. It would also be a location for our safety ambassadors, some of our community elders we work with in the summer especially, and our first responders to go to at night. Um, we think not only answering lower level calls and expanding our mutual aid, but also adding an off-campus safety center would be beneficial to safety, not only off-campus, but on-campus as well. And finally, um, that concludes my comments on our initiatives. I do want to recognize um, Officer Paul Elmstrand, Officer Matthew Ruge, and Firefighter Paramedic Adam Finseth. Um, they died serving their community on February 18th uh, in Burnsville. As you might know, Paul Elmstrand was a sworn officer with UMPD, and he'd spent two years working with us at athletic games, during athletic games, homecoming, and other events. We greatly appreciate his service to the university campus, and we recognize his sacrifice and the sacrifices of Matthew Ruge and Adam Spinseth on February 18th. That concludes my comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further, anything further you wish to add? President Not at this Chair? time. We'll have a separate presentation with Catherine Bonison, but perhaps the Chief could take the questions first on this component. Okay. Yes. All, all right. Um, well, if uh, colleagues want to ask questions or make comments, let us know. Um, I do have one question, and that goes to the what's now becoming a annual problem. Um, and that is that we're not fully staffed. We have authorization to hire more, and you've made inroads, but we're still not where we want you to be and where you want to be. And I'm curious whether you have any insight as to why that is. Is it lack of interest by uh, potential police officers, competition, we're not paying enough? What's is there anything we can be doing at our end to enhance your ability to hire more people? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, good question. I'm glad you asked that so I can explain some of the details. There's a few aspects that are important uh, there. One, I appreciate President Ettinger's assistance and also uh, former SVP Franz. When we needed to settle a contract or we needed to have a retention bonus, they were both 
more than willing to make sure that we were offering what was uh, reasonable considering the current status of hiring police officers in the Metro. Uh, there's a lot of competition knowing most of the chiefs in the Metro for good officers. There's a few aspects that I think are important when we talk about hiring. One is for the university, I would rather go with less than have a, the wrong officer working here. I want somebody that can switch hats easily, that uh, is a guardian and also an ambassador to the university and really enjoys working with young people and in a university atmosphere. So if they can't prove to me that they can do that, we would rather go without. Um, I will say this, we have less uh, ability because we have less trainers. We have a lot of applications, um, but we turn people away if they don't fit what works for a diverse community. And also if they have anything in their background that doesn't work for um, having a very clear uh, background process. We also found that um, there, we're, we're, we're getting a lot of applications from other lateral officers, meaning officers with many years of experience are coming to the university because they like the atmosphere. The thing that you can do the most, Madam Chair and Regents, is continue to support us. Um, when I interview every officer that comes across uh, with an application to our department, um, I say to them, you have to be happy. And it's very difficult in some communities to work there. Ours is not. We have a, actually a lot of support. And we expect our officers to uh, also show that support back to the community. So I think that's why we're, we're getting a lot of applications. It just takes a long time to hire an officer under the curtain, current state standards. Some officers take up to 18 months. Others we can get on, uh, if they have experience, we can bring them on in about three to four months. So the training process, which is five months total, just once they get into the department, plus backgrounds, it's a long process. I'm hoping to get about get up to 62 officers um, by mid-year. And that is pretty good considering we're at 46 two years ago. Thank you. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you, Chief Clark, for your presentation today. And as always, um, the work of you in the department. Two really quick things. One, um, regarding the MPD mutual aid initiative that you had talked about and taking some of those lower um, priority calls. I think that makes a lot of sense and the analysis that you provided um, today is one that I support. And then two, um, I heard you loud and clear that UMPD is stretched thin when you were talking earlier on in your presentation around um, the uh, officers helping out on the Metro Transit shifts and some of those supplemental shifts. And I'm guessing that is um, was a comment uh, related to staffing and some of the natural timelines that you just talked about related to hiring processes. But if there's anything else that you wanted to add on that point, I'd welcome that. And then third, um, the Dinky Town Safety Center or the off-campus safety center, I guess is what you said. Um, I think that's an excellent idea. I've been hearing about that for a while. That makes a ton of sense having been down in Dinky Town, um, meeting with some of our Somali Youth Link elders and the block by block and others having a convening space and all the other reasons that you identified to use that space, I think would make a lot of sense and be beneficial to students. So whatever we can do to support that from a um, real estate uh, resource side, um, and just wondering, and if I missed it, uh, please and please pardon me for that. Uh, but in terms of a timeline going into this year, and when we might hopefully be able to see that come to fruition. Thank you, Chief Clark, uh, Madam Chair, Regent. So, in terms of the safety center, we did have some discussions with a. Uh, location in the heart of Dinky Town. We think that's the best location uh, for an off-campus safety center. Those kind of fell through, and I think at soonest that we would get a off-campus safety center going would probably be the fall of this year, um, depending on uh, possible lease options or maybe using a university space that currently exists. Um, I believe the question was on transit and overtime. Um, last year we did a survey with students and one of the number one items that they talked about was safety on the transit lines. And I am very appreciative of Chief Morales, who was very responsive when we asked for assistance, especially in the fall. Uh, but 
I know that his numbers are extremely low for <coughs> officers and they are spread uh, very thin. So the request from his agency was that we would ride the train twice a night or twice a day, one in the, once in the morning and one in the after, once in the afternoon when we have the highest student ridership. And we agreed to do that. Uh, they have state funding that pays for that overtime for our officers. And I know from talking to officers and actually being on the train just a few days ago, it's very appreciated by everyone that rides a train to have officers on there. Um, I will say it's not in the best situation in terms of the amount of ridership that's going on on the train right now. And I know that uh, we're going to try to continue to do that for Metro Transit and for our students uh, into the future. Thank you. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, did you have any follow up? Yeah, briefly. Uh, thank you, Chief Clark. And my comment was more um, along the lines of when you were presenting that part of your presentation, you had made the general comment around um, the uh, uh, force feeling stretched thin. And I was presuming that was then a segue into what you said about staffing. And it sounds like it was. And so I appreciate that. And then as you um, said um, about Metro Transit, just now and provided some more details. I think anything the university can do to be helpful in the ongoing conversations um, around um, Metro Transit reform and some of the general conversations around the light rail as it relates to the safety of our students, understanding that our campus corridor is central um, to that line, uh, the green line, I believe, of Metro Transit. Um, anything we can do to lend the university's voice just as a, as a general comment to colleagues and to the administration, I think would would be well received, but thank you to to uh, folks from UMPD who are aiding in that, and I think it makes a lot of sense um, for our student, staff, faculty, community that we are providing that assistance. So thank you, Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron, <clears throat> Chief Clark. I'd like to go back and revisit where you ended your comments today. Um, anytime there's a loss of an on-duty officer. <laughs> It's really hard on the community, but it's often more acute on those who served with that officer or officers or public safety personnel. Um, can you speak to whether our current UMPD officers are feeling supported in the wake of Officer Elmstrand's death and if they're receiving the care and support uh, services that they need at this time, both mental health, family, position, all of those things. Madam Chair, Regent, uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree that <clears throat> wellness is a big part of uh, having healthy officers and having them do a great job. And when you ignore that, then uh, it's very difficult. And that comes out in a, many different ways because we're all human. So thank you for that. Um, I try to be as respectful as possible in speaking with the Burnsville chief and the Egan chief and others, especially during the funeral, that it is really their time as Burnsville. It's, uh, I don't know how else to describe what happened in Burnsville other than we've never seen something like that in Minnesota that I can remember. Um, at the same time, um, in talking to a lot of the officers, not only during the funeral, uh, but after and talking about what we do, um, we focused on wellness before that. We do, we were, I require officers speak to a counselor every year. And so a wellness checkup. And they don't have to say anything. But I do say that you have to talk to them. And what's funny is they actually do like to talk, <laughs> believe it or not. And um, our expression with that is it's important for us. So when you go into the, department and you're all welcome to get a tour someday if you want to come by you'll see um the four things i prioritize and they're on three signs throughout the department it's family fitness nutrition and sleep and it's on a sign that i made and then below that there's a line and it says retire and i from my experiences unless you have those four and you're focused on yourself and your family and all the other aspects of your life you're not going to be a good cop and you won't enjoy your retirement so the cumulative of during this time with your 30 plus years on with UMPD, and this also applies to our 911 dispatchers and security folks, they see a lot. I want you to be healthy. 
And so we do focus on that. Uh, it's, it's a key part of what we do. And we have uh, many different things, uh, like awards events. Uh, we have a chili cook-off coming next week. We have the taco thing going on. And we have other holiday events. And that's, it's as a family. And I think that's why people want to come to UMPD. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Chief. Oh, uh, Regent Gully. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief, and thank you, Regent Verhalen, for your comments on that. Um, one of the things that we did in our city was offer uh, to send officers over to Brinsville to support and just to back up other police departments, and we authorized some funding to support that. Um, not that you have to have a proposal right this second, but is there anything that we can do to help you all um, not only to be okay as a department, but also to support other departments that I know are trying to step up their efforts to um, support the Brinsville police and fire in this moment? Um, well, I know we're, Madam Chair, yes. Regent, uh, we're, we're in a We've talked about that. I don't necessarily want to talk too much about that right now. Um, we have some options available. And I think as we get into the fall season, once there's some time in between the event and, and then, uh, we are looking at some things that we've discussed that would be uh, a recognition and a healing event, if you will, uh, not only for our officers, but the, for the campus. And I, I really appreciate um, you bringing up that question as well. Like I said, I, I'm getting close to retirement myself. I've been doing mm -hmm. it since 1991, and I've seen a lot of different positive and negative things in policing. And the best officers are the ones that are healthy, mentally and physically, and the ones that are supported. And so um, seeing 10,000 people go to a funeral um, this past uh, week was amazing and it is part of what should be recognized as uh, we're all to get in it together and the more we support each other and the more we're deliberate about that uh, the better we're going to be as a community as a whole thank you anything else thank you chief clark excellent presentation again thank, thank you. you for your service All right, our next item is to review and act on an employment. Oh, no, I still have a second. Oh, part. I'm sorry. We have a second presentation. I apologize, Associate Vice President Bonison. And now we will continue with an update from Associate Vice President Bonison. So, if I could introduce Catherine Bonison, our Associate Vice President in the Health, Safety, and Risk Management area, to discuss the University of Minnesota system wide safety plan. So in addition to the great things happening in public safety, some of which Chief Clark covered today and will continue to report on in the future, our teams have been focused on updating the system-wide safety plan in the areas of IT security, lab safety, environmental safety, public health, mental health, and the prevention of sexual misconduct. This is important work and supports the emphasis the board has placed on safety in the broadest sense of the word. I thank Catherine and the staff who have worked on these updates, as well as those who provided feedback during consultation. Some of the public safety elements of the plan are still in development, and we will report back on those in the future. Before we transition to Catherine's presentation, I do want to mention one additional safety-related project currently underway. In alignment with our Impact 2025 strategic plan goal to assess and enhance our campus safety protocols and organizational structures, we have issued a request for proposals to bring in an expert to help assess our current safety organizational structures on the Twin Cities campus, comparing them to benchmarks and ensuring alignment with our strategic objectives. I will now turn it over to Associate Vice President Catherine Bonison for remarks on our safety plan. Thank you. Thank you, Interim President Ettinger. Thank you, Chair Mayron, members of the board. Happy to be here. And I thought I was going to get away with it, Chair Mayron. No, <laughs> luckily I got dinged to the right. <laughs> I'll try to be as brief as possible. You don't so, need to. <laughs> over the past few months, we have gathered annual updates for the University of Minnesota's system-wide safety plan. This plan, which was first introduced in December 2021, 
is a component of Impact 2025. It supports the university's strategic safety commitments, all of which rely on creating an environment where students, staff, and faculty feel safe or on and around campus. Our safety plan identifies five core goals that serve as a roadmap for a holistic approach to continuous improvement and safety. I'm going to briefly anchor us in those five goals. So the first one is to support a culture of respect and safety across our campuses. The second one is to create effective, inclusive, transparent lines of communication that promote safety as a key value across our system. The third is to develop and implement robust planning and preparedness tools. The fourth is to continually approve upon effective response systems and strategies. The fifth is to innovate and expand upon environmental, mental, and physical well-being safety systems and networks to holistically support our campus communities. So last year, each campus developed actions and tactics to support these five goals. We are proud of the progress that we have made, that they have made um, as a system. So I will briefly describe and highlight some of these um, key related accomplishments system-wide and then a couple from our system campuses. So the first one we'll bring to light, this is a system-wide um, key metric. Our Department of Emergency Management received $154,000 from FEMA in grant funding to do a comprehensive review and update of our hazard mitigation plan. This plan will help us position all of our campuses to be more resilient against natural and man-made disasters. It's also required. <laughs> so we're excited to have the funding, but, and it's a great plan to do. The second one is our health, safety, and risk management group, working with partners such as OIT and others, we were able to launch automated severe weather alerts. So these are the alerts that come through on your phone that say there's a, um, a thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning. The reason this is such a big improvement is it takes out the manual piece. And it's also great, especially in our system campuses, that someone's not waking up at 3 AM in the morning to try to manually enter these and get them, get them off. So that was, a big, that was a big win. The third system-wide um, achievement we'd like to recognize is we had team members from across our campuses, our Health Emergency Response Office, Health Safety and Risk Management, and many others. We were able to expand access to health safety training such as CPR, AED, Stop the, Ble Stop the Bleed. And these groups, we were able to collectively have hundreds of folks come in and take this training, which we think is very critical. Additionally, these same teams are working to just improve safety training overall, to make it more interesting um, and improve the usability. It is tricky sometimes to get people to want to take ladder safety training. So we are working to make it more interesting um, across the system. So for a look around the state, as we talk about achievements in Duluth in August, Duluth leadership and safety personnel, along with community partners, attended a three-day course on crisis management in higher education. The training focused on holistic approach to crisis management, which allowed um, a lot of folks to come back to the campus, review and update their own response plans at, with these lessons learned. In Crookston, the Office of Residential Life implemented a new program called eRes Life, and now allows public safety to use the same communication tool for students where they might find out information about a meal plan. Public safety can also communicate about an incident or um, something that they might need to know from a safety perspective. So they were able to streamline those communications. On our Morris campus, safety leaders attended event management and incident response training last summer, which was hosted by the National Emergency Response and Recovery Training Center. Um, it's, this supports their campus uh, preparedness goals, and these trainings are also free and provided by the federal government, which is wonderful. In Rochester, Rochester enhanced a public safety education campaign with a um, campaign titled Things You Should Know, targeted to their students. This campaign includes a central website, uh, improved usability, safety resources and toolkits, and a portal to report safety concerns and questions. And finally, on our Twin Cities campus, we had a cross-functional work group from student services, emergency management, health emergency response, and many others are working together to develop a campus reunification plan. So this is a plan you would use post-incident. Um, it's a plan you hope you never have to use, but we think it's very important that we have it. Um, emergency management, classroom management, and the university and university relations are also working on an exciting project to update emergency response materials to be available in classrooms so to make them more relevant. One of the things we hear often is not just how to deal with sort of the black swan, the worst case scenario, it's how to deal with disruptive behavior. What do I do when I get this alert that says shelter in place? So we're trying to give them easy to use tools that help them make those decisions very quickly. 
So we're excited about these projects. We're excited about all the progress we've made across the system. And that concludes my brief updates. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, our next item on the agenda is to review and act on the employment agreement with President-designate Cunningham. Since we reviewed finalists last week, we have heard overwhelmingly the positive feedback from the university community and people across the state. President-designate Cunningham is the right leader to help us write the University of Minnesota's next chapter. As we contemplate and act on the proposed employment agreement, let me remind you of some guiding principles from our own policies. The first guiding principle comes from the Board of Regents policy, employee compensation and recognition. This states, the university strives to achieve and maintain a compensation structure that when combined with benefits and other rewards is competitive relative to institutional peers and other appropriate labor markets and serves to attract and retain a high performance workforce. Additionally, the same policy states that the university seeks to reward meritorious performance and employee contribution to the success of the university through compensation and other forms of recognition. In setting initial salaries and subsequent pay adjustment, the university considers the work responsibilities, market internal equity, experience and expertise, performance and other criteria as appropriate. And the last part of that policy as part of our guiding principles states, the university adheres to compensation and recognition practices that are fair and equitable in the design application and delivery. It also states, uh, no, that's what it states. So I don't need to add anything more there, but I did want you all to be aware of the policies that do, do guide our discussion here today. Board leadership has worked closely with our general counsel to prepare an employment agreement that is before us today that is in the docket. It is a market competitive agreement that speaks to Dr. Cunningham's skill and experience. The agreement is five years in length and establishes base salary and retirement contributions that place Dr. Cunningham at approximately the 75th percentile of her Big Ten and AAU peers. Regents, I know you have all had a chance to, op, to review the proposed amendment, or I'm sorry, the proposed employment agreement. Are there any clarifying questions or comments before I ask for a motion and we discuss the motion? All right, hearing none, colleagues, is there a motion to approve the employment agreement? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Regent Cully. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say, just like everyone else, we've been in this search for a long time, and um, I've been thinking about this agreement for the last um, week. Is that how long ago we've had it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and um, I just really appreciate the thought and care that went into this. Um, it is a very significant commitment, um, both for us to have a new president and also for this new president to come. Um, uh, I, you know, I sometimes struggle with these very expensive employment agreements. And also I feel like there was a lot of care taken for it to be right sized in a lot of ways. Um, and so I, I appreciate the work that um, folks did to get this right. Um, we landed in the 50th percentile, I think for um, peer institutions and Correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> that was what I what I saw, and I felt like the terms um, were a fair negotiation of what uh, our incoming president asked for, and also what we needed as a university. Um, so I sincerely appreciate the work that went into it, and Thank you. I'm very excited to have her. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just uh, to be clear, so her base salary is between the 50th and 
fifth percentile of the um, the metrics that we looked at, that's base salary. Her total compensation, which is base salary plus her supplemental retirement benefits, puts her just slightly above the 75th percentile. So I just want to make sure that that's clear well, to everybody. Yeah, I appreciate the clarification. Okay. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Really briefly, um, I'd echo what we all, pretty much all of what Regent Gully said, and I'm really excited for President Designate Cunningham to begin at the university. And this is just a quick clarifying question, Madam Chair, and I couldn't get to my raised hand button fast enough when you asked for them earlier. Um, am I correct in seeing in the draft um, employment agreement that there's no uh, performance based or any bonus incentives as part of evaluation? Am I correct in that? That's correct. There's no performance bonus. There's no car allowance. There's no uh, amount for an executive physical uh, and also the provision in that uh, the president will not take on a um, an appointment uh, with a private or public institution for compensation. Yes, uh, great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd echo what um, Regent Gully said then, and I'm looking forward to supporting this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regent Hipsch. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayor Ron. I, I concur with our other regents who have already spoken. It's a fair deal, and I'm excited to get her on board. Thank you, Regent Hipsch. Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I'd be remiss if I also didn't thank Dr. Cunningham, President Designate Cunningham, for working so quickly with the university teams so that we could have an agreement at this regularly scheduled board meeting. I, for one, fully expected we were going to need a special board meeting between now and May to discuss this. And so I really appreciate the work by our general counsel's office, by you, Chair Mayron, in negotiating this. Um, it just very swift work is, is really appreciated to dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and move this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any any other discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, hearing uh, no further questions or comments, all those in favor of the motions, please say aye. 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 Please, all those in, opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. Our next item of action on the, is the proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, institutional conflict of interest as it relates to presidential conflicts of interest. Executive Director Steves, would you like to start? Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, the purpose of this item is to act on proposed amendments to the uh, institutional conflict of interest policy as it relates to presidential conflicts of interest. Uh, this is an off-cycle review that um, was taken up just to address this one particular issue. Uh, the Governance and Policy Committee has discussed this extensively both in December of 2023 and February of 2024. And the changes that you see in front of you in the docket today uh, benefit from that input and that, that guidance of the committee. Uh, the one change that has been made since the committee discussed it in February was that in Section 5, Subdivision 3, we inserted the language, um, the mission and reputation of the university in the second sentence. But um, beyond that, it is, it is as the committee last uh, discussed it. The, uh, the primary change that uh, is effectuated by, these, by this policy amendment would be to create a new process for handling institutional conflicts of interest involving the president. Uh, currently, the same process is used for the president as any other employee. And this, that, that um, we, we've found from experience uh, is a challenging situation to, to try and navigate when you have direct reports to the president attempting to um, work through a potential conflict involving, uh, involving their, um, their direct supervisor. Uh, and so this, uh, this amendment creates a new independent process related just to the president um, as your primary employee. Uh, it creates an independent panel that would be convened as needed by the board chair to review such uh, potential conflicts and make recommendations back to the board. It would include one regent who would serve as chair of that panel, uh, one additional regent, uh, so two regents total. Uh, it would include the chief auditor, 
as uh, a direct report to the board and someone who understands the university and would bring expertise in this area. It would include the chair of the University Senate Consultative Committee, which <coughs> aligns with um, other areas of university policy or board policy where you bring in uh, faculty leadership to, um, to a conversation like this. Uh, it would include a community member, and that could be someone who brought perhaps special expertise in the, the issue that was at hand, or it could be a region emeritus, or it could be you know, whomever the, the chair felt was, was particularly equipped to um, evaluate the, the situation. And uh, the panel would be advised by the general counsel's office, uh, outside counsel as deemed appropriate, uh, as well as the Office of Institutional Compliance. And it would be receiving staff support both from the Office of Institutional Compliance and the Office of the Board of Regents. So those are the amendments before you. Um, there are, uh, there was, you know, since we were in there, uh, we were able to clean up a couple of other, um, a couple of other items related to financial disclosures, as well as um, restoring the position of chief, to, chief of staff to the university officials list. But uh, those are unrelated to the primary reason it was open. But since it was there and we were able to clean them up, we uh, we put those amendments in. Um, with that, Madam Chair, those are the that is the proposal. All right. Thank you very much, Executive Director Steves. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, is there a motion to approve the proposed amendments? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Yes, Regent Verhalen. Um, I would just, as a point of privilege, Chair Mayron would like to just thank the Governance and Policy Committee for um, really thoughtfully approaching this uh, policy because you know it's important and required a lot of thoughtfulness in putting it together and honestly we we as ourselves wouldn't have been able to do it without OBR's st OBR staff's help um, in in taking all of our thoughts and concerns and really codifying them in in this resolution and so I just wanted to express my appreciation thank you and as vice chair I will echo Regent Verhalen's uh, comments as vice chair to the governance and policy. When we initially had our first discussion about this and the one we're about to, the reservation and our delegation, honestly, we, with all the thoughts that were swirling around from our subcommittee, I thought, how are we ever going to coalesce around anything. We're just whirling dervishes here. <laughs> but OBR managed to take all our thoughts and come up with a proposal right off the bat that um, we could very quickly buy into. So I thank them as well. All right, uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And this is just a question perhaps generally to um, any of my colleagues who serve on governance and policy or whoever wants to answer this. Um, around the chief auditor's participation on the this to be potentially to be formed new presidential institutional conflict review panel, um, I was a little uncomfortable with the chief auditor's as a as a position um, involvement in kind of what our current iteration is of the institutional conflict review um, evaluation and how it played out last time. And I guess I'm just looking for a little bit more of the why. Um, for this new proposed policy, um, as I think of it, you know, the chief auditor really, um, it, you know, it needs to be in that position to be able to look at um, processes as they've played out um, and have that holistic sense, not having been a part of the process. And I'm saying this just in general about my understanding of the roles, but also, um, again, how um, this uh, presidential conflict review has previously Played out. So I guess I'd just like to hear a little bit more about that position in particular um, being included. Thank you. And I'll just make a quick comment, then I'll call on Regent Verhalen. But my, in the past, the chief auditor reported to the president. And now the chief auditor reports to the Board of Regents. And so at that point, we felt that the chief auditor has, as someone who reports to us, has the adequate independence 
uh, to be able to assist us and specialized expertise, to be frank as well, that could be very helpful to any uh, committee that had to look at a potential conflict of interest of the president. That's my understanding of, of why we continue to have that position be part of this committee. But maybe Regent Fairhill and you have something else you can add. I, Chair Mayron, I, I agree with your assessment. I think it's also really important to note that as part of a healthy auditing function within any organization, which we have here at the university, um, any activities that our chief auditor participates in are also subject to other audit. And we have third party auditors, we have others who, while they report through the chief auditor's function, they are all taking an, an they all take on the duty of reporting audit as they see it, uh, however that may come. And so with those oversights as well, there is still an auditing function uh, to make sure that our chief auditor is doing what our chief auditor is supposed to do in our chief auditor's role, but also that chief auditor is reporting to us, not the president, and has an independent way to look at any sort of conflict of interest that may arise for the president that puts our chief auditor in a really unique position. And we thought that that um, line of sight was really important to have in the conflict management membership. So to answer your question, Regent Farnsworth. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Chair Mayron, Regent for Halen, for the clarifications. I guess um, that's helpful. Um, I would then say, uh, in terms of the, you know, I hear the explanation around um, the chair of the, is it uh, chair of the University Senate Consultative Committee? I know that um, position is um, one that often works, you know, in close consultation um, with the president's office, with other administration within shared governance, but um, I'll just, I'll leave that there. But um, uh, I think that that answers my uh, questions and comments for now. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, did you have a comment? I didn't, I didn't think you saw my hand. I, uh, I, I didn't, but I have a note. <laughs> okay. All right. uh, Brian says but, nothing. Yeah, yeah. Or Brian sees all. Um, <laughs> it, it was on that last topic. Actually, I was just weighing in because I when the cha the changes you alluded to when they happened, I was in committee leadership, and I I appreciate Regent Farnsworth bringing up the question. You know, four years ago, five years ago, that wouldn't make sense to me. But I we have taken steps to really clarify that reporting line. Um, the chief auditor reports to the board. Um, I think there were changes to evaluation process, um, and even there were changes or are currently changes to the language around the chief auditor's participation in the cabinet. I mean, so I, I, we were taking a lot of steps to clarify the chief auditor reports to the board, works with the administration, has to work with the administration, should work with the administration. And actually, I think placing them on this panel reinforces that message because we're saying no direct reports um, are going to be on this panel and we're trying to remove this panel out of that process. So I think putting the chief auditor on it reinforces the message that they are outside of uh, the administrative tower, if you will. But, Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments on this uh, proposed resolution? All right. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All, those, aye. all those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved, and I forgot to say I, but I for me too. Okay. Uh, our ninth item of business is to review the proposed amendments to Board of Regents policy, reservation, and delegation of authority. Executive Director Steves, please get us started. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, the Governance and Policy Committee has been busy. So uh, this comes also from the Governance and Policy Committee and uh, has been discussed and reviewed in, in, uh, um, across several meetings. And we have um, a number of, pretend, of proposed amendments to walk through. So bear with me as we walk through them. We've got them in a chart in the, in the docket and I plan to walk through them one by one. Uh, in doing this comprehensive review of this policy, and I often talk about, um, uh, many of you have heard me talk about the four fundamental governance questions, the things that you keep coming back to as a governing board. Uh, this policy is directly on point with one of those questions. This is all about what authority are you retaining as a board and what are you delegating to the administration. 
And so that's why this is one of your most foundational policies. You have your bylaws, you have this, you have board operations and agenda guidelines, which sets up your committee structure and all of the related how business flows through. Those are really the core of how you decide to operate as a board. And so um, as we walk through this, uh, we, we identified some principles to guide the, the amendments process here, and that is around strengthening public confidence in your decision making, around allowing you to carry out your fiduciary over and oversight duties while focusing on consequential items. That's, that's key, it's both. You have to have those, that oversight responsibility, but you can't oversee everything, otherwise you lose sight of what's consequential, and so we're trying to strike the right balance in this. Um, that you continue to have alignment, clarity, and accountability, but also avoid surprises and areas of risk that might crop up. And then uh, we really did focus on trying to use a risk-based approach to thinking through these so that uh, those areas where there is low risk, you are not spending as much time on, and areas of higher risk, you are spending more time on. And so. Uh, that's what's guided all of this. We've been doing it in close um, consultation with and collaboration with a number of offices across the administration. And um, I think that the items that we have in front of you, the proposals we have in front of you, um, have broad buy-in and support uh, from, from those offices as well. So uh, I'll walk through them. You'll see, in the, you'll see in the docket you have a maroon and gold and white uh, document. And so we're just going to walk through one by one just to make sure that you are fully informed about what these uh, changes would do. First line is fundamental planning documents. This would simply change the language that refers to these documents and also add a cross-reference to board operations and agenda guidelines. The second item is reports to the state of Minnesota. Uh, this will clarify that the reports that need to come back to the Board of Regents are those that, um, and these are reports that the state of Minnesota will require of the university. Those that require, require coming back to the Board of Regents are those that relate to the university. For instance, sometimes the legislature will say, we want to report on aquatic invasive species. We're saying that doesn't need to come back to the board. That's that's about the university's expertise in a particular area. But if the board, if the legislature says we want a uh, report on how you're using uh, state bonding dollars, that would come back to the board first and then go to the legislature. So that's what this clarifies. The uh, the gold uh, denotes in this in this table items that have changed since um, since they were presented to the governance and policy committee, and this is based on input from the governance and policy committee. So appointments, um, and I'm going to get through all these, but I know that this one may be one that folks have questions about, so we can come back to it. Uh, right now, you enumerate uh, a series of positions in in policy uh, that. The president appoints, but they come here for approval or confirmation. Uh, what this change, what, what the policy language in front of you would do would be to add division one head coaches for football, men's and women's basketball, men's and women's hockey, and volleyball to that list of positions that need to come here for approval, those, those agreements with those, those employment agreements with those individuals. And then it would eliminate the other language in policy that currently exists, where it's a, a, a lengthy paragraph that um, describes um, that describes thresholds around which employment agreements get triggered to come here, um, and in essence, it it says that. Uh, if the day after you signed someone to the employment agreement and you terminated them and you, you would need to pay them over a million dollars um, in terminating them, then it would need to come here. But it is a, it's, it's difficult language to um, understand. It's difficult language to sometimes implement. And, um, and so the proposal before you right now is to actually name the positions that the board is most interested in having direct oversight of based on the the, the markets for those positions. On to the next page, system-wide enrollment plan. Um, currently, uh, enrollment plans have come to the board for approval, but they've been very campus by campus. Um, uh, they have been, uh, uh, they haven't been all tied together in some way. And what this is suggesting, this is an area where the board is, um, is 
setting out what it wants to see, not what is there, there right now, and what it wants to see, what you would want to see if adopting this is a, a system-wide enrollment plan, something that knits together enrollment planning across all five campuses. Purchasing goods and of goods and services, uh, it would increase this, this threshold from $1 million to $5 million. Um, and it would uh, it clarify that that is both the initial value of the contract and any optional contract extensions that you'd have to add in in order to determine whether you've met that threshold. Uh, the second line item related to that would say that um, if you've approved amendments to individual purchases of goods and services uh, previously, but the value of that increases by more than 30%. In other words, there's been like a contract change that's been initiated where the contract value increases by more than 30%. Um, say there's like a cost overrun or something like that. Or if um, uh, existing individual purchases of goods and services that were not previously approved now somehow because, because of a change exceed the $5 million, those would all trigger um, needing to come to the Board of Regents. I know this is a bit convoluted, but we've worked on it carefully, and, it's, and uh, we, we've got, I think, a solid language here that um, the administration believes that they can implement on this. For the purchase or sale of real property, uh, right now it has a $1 million threshold or has various distances or you know, size of parcel requirements. <laughs> This would leave those distance and size of parcel uh, requirements in place, but increase the threshold to $3 million. Uh, lease, easements, or other interests in real properties, the property, this would, um, this would, this would indicate that it's, uh, it remains at $1 million or more per year, um, and, uh, or if a lease exceeds 10 years in length or the total value is five million or more. So it adds more clarity around some of these leases that we enter into. Uh, it's really trying to target those leases that are uh, significant in terms of their dollar value on an annual basis or length or in total. And so that's what this aims to get at. Uh, campus master plans just updates to align with current language that is used for those. It, it, it will change to just campus plans. Uh, Multi-year capital plans and annual capital budgets uh, would increase from $1 million threshold to $5 million threshold. Uh, it's roughly in the middle of the Big Ten. Uh, in your docket, you have peer, peer data from Big Ten institutions. Um, in many cases, what you see is that these thresholds were set years ago. They've been in place for many years. There's been a lot of inflation over time, and so these, these thresholds are being moved in line with that. Uh, capital budget amendments would uh, change from $1 million to uh, new projects with a value of $5 million or existing projects that were not previously approved by the board when the total value increases to $5 million or more or projects that were approved and the total cost increases by 30% or more. So this echoes the same, the same kind of notion that uh, if there is a cost overrun <coughs> of more than 30%, the board would like to know about that. Um, and, and evaluate it. Schematic plans uh, would be eliminated from board approval in this. Um, we, uh, we all collectively have tried to remember a single time when the board um, uh, rejected a schematic plan or, or frankly added any value on a schematic plan and we couldn't come up with one. Um, retirement plans. Uh, retirement plans would simply, instead of requiring those to come, uh, requiring amendments to re retirement plans to come to the board for approval, uh, every time there's a change, it would say if the change is being required by federal mandates, you can just go ahead and make those um, because we always have been aligning with what the federal mandates are related to retirement plans. <laughs> Uh, individually negotiated employment agreements and significant amendments. Um, this, this is the language that I was talking about previously, this, this kind of um, $1 million uh, payout if, if you were terminated the day after you signed your contract. That would be eliminated in favor of the naming of specific positions um, that the board most wants to have oversight over because they have market salaries that are of a level that the board deems um, needing some kind of oversight. 
uh, employee agreements and severance agreements. This, uh, this would clarify that uh, when there are individually negotiated terms, the board reserves to itself authority to review those terms or severance agreements when they raise unusual questions of public interest or public policy or have a significant impact on the, on the university's mission. Um, this is really just to, um, I, these, are, these are few and far between, but it's, it's to ensure that the board has some oversight over um, potentially having a, um, a very lucrative severance agreement signed with someone and, and you not being aware of that. Uh, and then the chief auditor adjustment that was just uh, referenced earlier uh, changes the terminology, and this was related to uh, uh, Regent Gully, your amendment in a different policy. This aligns this policy with that one, saying that instead of serving on the president's cabinet, the chief auditor may participate on the president's cabinet. Those are the... Um, those are the amendments, and thank you for bearing with me as I tried to, in a very shorthand way, describe a lot of dense policy language. Uh, but we um, uh, are happy to put those in front of you, and as I said, it's been a real um, group effort to try and ensure that we're getting the right language and that we're looking at all the various angles, and we've been looking at peer data and um, evaluating kind of past practice of the board in a number of cases, and so we, um, we bring those before you for consideration. All right, before I take a motion, are there any points of clarification that anybody wishes to ask? And, and Madam Chair, I should just clarify, oh. it is, um, it's been brought forward for review today, ah. although I will say, we would be happy if the board wanted to adopt these today, so. <laughs> All right, <laughs> good point. All right, uh, well, let me then open because we, Oh, uh, well, we don't yet have a motion unless I would like to move on and I would like to move it forward if we could. Or do you want or do you want, would you rather you view it? I don't think it's, you know, I think it's good. We've all seen it. Yes. <clears throat> um, just from a procedural standpoint, I would suggest that we talk about these revisions first and then seeing where the conversation goes, see if we can make a motion to move this forward, the, even though uh, Associate Secretary Langworthy is not here physically, he is here in spirit, and his parliamentarian voice is screaming at me saying, but we can only do that if there's no objection, and I think we should talk first, see how people are feeling about it to see if there is any objection, because if there is an objection, then we couldn't move it forward. That's right. All right, I hear... Yeah. Mr. Langworthy as well, he's ringing in my ear, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, shouting in my ear, so I'm going to hold you up on your motion right, right now. Any discussion on this uh, proposal? Yes, Regent Verhalen. Uh, Are you objecting to your own proposal? I am not. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I wanted to add a little bit more uh, background to a couple of these items because the way that they have proceeded, I think, is really valuable for purposes of our discussion. Um, the first is the changing of the thresholds. It is an increase in a number of the thresholds, but as uh, Executive Director Steves mentioned, it is keeping in line with what comparative peer institutions are doing. It's also keeping in mind the last time they were set was a number of years ago, uh, inflation, et cetera, but also the work that we do and in moving those thresholds, we have closed some really significant data gaps as far as oversight, which I think is really important. So in that, while the threshold, the proposed threshold is changing from as a standard, it's <clears throat> different in a couple places, but as a standard rule from a million to five million, what we have done is closed a couple areas where if something fell below that $5 million threshold and then increases due to whatever reason, by more than 30%, it has to come to us. So there is an added oversight that isn't there now. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is while we are eliminating the review of schematic plans, we have added in any capital approvals that we undertake if through the design process, which includes schematic plans, through the design process, there is an identified increase of that project of more than $30 million or the proposed 30%, excuse me, not 30 million, 
30% from what we approved, then it needs to come back before us before it can move forward. And those are some gaps that honestly, there were some blind spots in the way the policy was written before. While certain approvals could have occurred, there could have been cost overruns, there could have been um, known increases that weren't coming back before this board just because of the way the, the policy was written. If someone goes to look at it, it may not be as clear on the face to them what that meant. And so the Governance and Policy Committee in coming forward with this is really bringing forward what we have worked really hard to make a balanced approach to these kinds of issues that come to this Board of Regents. The one area where we were, you know, transparently a bit stuck and really where it came to in as a governance and policy committee, we are not going to make a formal recommendation on what the policy should be. We're going to move it forward to this board because the full board should be part of the discussion is around Article 1, Section 4, Subdivision 1, and what positions should be listed as those that uh, come before the board for clarity. The prior language was really hard to discern. It was really hard to apply and, and navigate through. Um, and the proposed amendments as presented today bring forward that balance as well by identifying the specific positions that would be added to the existing A through K um, for that. And so I appreciate the additional time to provide that. Chair Mayron. Thank you. And, and I'm just going to add as vice chair to the <clears throat> governance and policy that part of the reason that we took on this issue from the beginning is uh, um, one of the reasons was inflation. And so the numbers no longer seemed as relevant that we had in our policy because of inflation, because the policy was, frankly, uh, several years old. Um, two is we wanted to see what our peers were doing. And interestingly, we learned that some of our peers don't require a number of these items to come back to their board or their board of trustees at all. But we wanted to get that information. And third, uh, we one of the lenses we look through as a governance committee is what value are we adding as a board of regents over what our administration is doing? Are we adding value on um, on these different uh, items that we need to approve? And the schematic schematic uh, design uh, documents was a perfect example where it was clear none of us had any expertise could add any value as to whether this was an appropriate design or not. And so why add items that the administration has to come to us on if in fact we as a board aren't adding any value to it. So those are some of the big picture lenses that we were looking at as we went through each of these items. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and thank you to the uh, Governance and Policy, uh, members of the Governance and Policy Committee and OBR for your work on this. Um, as someone who is not a member of the Governance and Policy Committee, I've been trying to uh, follow the discussions around these, uh, this policy and the approval thresholds um, along the way up until this point. And um, as someone who, you know, isn't kind of by matter of principle, isn't always keen on the idea just generally of of giving back oversight or feeling like I'm giving back oversight. I actually think the walkthrough that Regent for Halen just did of some of the specific areas and connecting the dots with um, where there may be, uh, I'm losing my phrasing, but where there may be kind of backstops or certain areas where things can come back um, and connecting some of those dots that I didn't on certain areas made me feel more comfortable um, with these, these policy amendments. So I appreciate that. Um, I'd also say just kind of generally, um, for me, it absolutely is when looking at policy like this, um, it's important to think about where the board can add value um, on certain pieces. However, I also think a key part of this is um, information and um, things that are available to the public in terms of the governance of the university. So, well, you know, we, we all bring different expertise and different things. Um, and different lived experiences, um, and we may or may not bring value into certain areas as a board or as individual regents, I think it is important to think about the role that uh, the information um, from these pieces um, that goes towards the governance of the university being available to the public, and that lens and input and output as well 
is something that I think about when we approach these. That said, uh, I think that these amendments generally make sense. Um, I know um, we'll see, depending on the rest of the conversation, uh, what happens with uh, potentially going to review and action, um, which is a, a concept that I generally think we should be really careful about, but um, in this instance, would support. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent um, Wheeler. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair Mayor. And, uh, you know, I just want to echo that I, I'm really appreciative of these changes and the diligence by which Governance and Policy Committee and the Office of Board of Regents reviewed that and looked at peer institutions and to reflect the comments of uh, Regent Verhalen, you know, and the specifics looked at that very, very carefully. The other thing I would just mention is that not only did we look at where we weren't adding value, which seemed in these areas, but we actually were we actually hindering things. So we were actually delaying some things that need not be delayed. So I just wanted to make that, uh, and, and like Regent Farnsworth, I would also be uh, willing and, and wanting to move forward on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Steves, and, and the Governance Committee for, for the work. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I agree with a lot of what's been said and for myself had to kind of walk myself through the kind of getting there because I think the initial reaction is, you know, whoa, but the inflation piece is spot on. I think the last piece Regent Wheeler said about hindering, um, you know, some of these are time sensitive um, actions, right, and, and, and having to come here. So that totally makes sense. I, I do like the comment that Regent Farnsworth pointed out, though, that um, and not just these kinds of approvals, but a lot of the stuff that goes through the board, it's for us and the public. Um, putting something on the docket and having it sit there um, for a week makes it accessible to everyone. Um, so that, that's just a consideration um, as well. With that being said, I am certainly in support of most of these, uh, really overwhelmingly. I do have a question. Um, I, I'm trying to follow along, but it gets kind of confusing because it refers to the other one. Um, and it's, it's around the, cap, the capital budget amendments portion, and specifically, I think, B in the proposed changes. That's existing projects that were previously approved by the board. Um, and I think that threshold is $5 million. Um, am, I, am I understanding that correctly, that that's I see Regent Verhalen getting ready to answer, but th that's that's an that's a item that already came to the board, and then it has to change by five million or more to have to come back for for reconsideration. Is that correct? No. Okay. <laughs> Should I run, may I? Yeah. Do you sure, want to explain you. that? Yep. Uh, so you're referring to Article One, Section Eight, Subdivision Eight, correct? The capital budget amendment. That's the one. Okay. So Section A is new projects. Any new project that comes before us with an overall budget of five million or more. Yes. B is a project that did not previously come to us, but went from 4.5 million to 5.5 million in the budgeting process, design process, schematic process, procurement process. Then it needs to come to us for approval if it crosses that threshold and becomes five million. C is if there is a project where we previously approved it at five million or more, but in the design and implementation process, increases the overall budget by 30% or more, then it has to come to us for approval so that we're not surprised when we get the final bill. Yes, the, there was a word not in B that I missed. It's okay. Thank you, Counselor. Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, that, that's very helpful. So I guess my comment was about C. <laughs> um, and that's probably the one where I'd maybe like to see that number a little lower, the 30, um, especially because that's something that's already come before the board. I, I don't think it's a big of a deal in the uh, lower numbers, and I mean relatively lower, because that's, you know, uh, a few million. But if, if this is a big capital uh, project at, let's just for simple math, 100 million, um, changing to 120, I think, is a significant change that, you know, I'd like to see back in front of the board, um, especially, and again, I don't know if this is factored here, but especially because some of these uh, projects also have a, a legislative component. So they may have been part of our legislative ask. So how do we factor that in um, with those? But again, I, I'm, I'm trying to track here, but I hope that made sense. Let me uh, see if Regent Verhillen might be able to answer how we arrived at the 30% uh, piece of it. So go ahead. Yeah, um, the 30% is, uh, is really an, a 
number starting point that came out of discussions around um, uh, what other state agencies implement for oversight of infrastructure costs. Um, and so 30% was where they're granting approval for like customer cost recovery or those kinds of things. Um, I, I don't think there was any specific debate to go 30% versus 20%. Um, both of those seem a reasonable range. Uh, to your second question, I'll hand off to Executive Director Steves after saying, whatever we've requested from the legislature and the legislature approved is the money we get from the legislature. If there's a change in cost, we have to come up with the money ourselves or go ask for more money from the legislature. And so these thresholds wouldn't have any impact on our general ap approach with the legislature or any legislative projects. Executive Director Steves, is that correct? Uh, that, Madam Chair, yes, that's, uh, uh, I stand by Re Regent Verhalen's comments. <laughs> it's good, that'd be uh, really embarrassing. <laughs> <if you did. laughs> Um, and I guess I would just add is this this uh, this element is a new element right. entirely of board oversight um, previously if that project that went from you know you, that you said from 100 million to 120 there is no requirement here there was there wasn't any requirement for it to come back and so um, the 30 percent was something that the committee seemed to coalesce around as you know they, they they wanted to set the bar high enough that it's not triggered right away for a, a, a smallish overrun but they um they also i think were, were maybe experimenting here a little <laughs> bit with saying that that this board wants to ensure that um that projects that um were previously approved and then all of a sudden balloon in some way that, that, that the board needs to see those again. And so that's where they landed. Blue line extension. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Regent Verhill. My, my last point is I think the beauty of being a self-designating board is that if, if we decide the 30% is too much, we can always bring it down. We could always bring it up too, but it was a, it was a I'm not going to say compromise because there was no compromise around it. It was really mm -hmm. a coalescing around a percentage of this is a percentage that seems to feel um, it's material, but it is also not overly burdensome. Madam Chair, briefly. Yes. Um, Mr. Steve, so you said um, there's no requirement for, for those changes to come back. They were coming back voluntarily then, right? Am I making it up? I feel like we do capital budget, uh, capital budget amendments regularly, correct? Madam Chair, um, Regent Kenyanya, yes, there are capital budget amendments when there's additional sources of funding that need to be identified for a, for a capital project. But right now, we don't have a, a specific percentage built in or any kind of um, uh, requirement that would be triggered for requiring a board approval if, for some reason, the administration had sources of money that could be knit together to cover whatever it, uh, whatever it is, previously approved sources of money. Okay, that's helpful. In closing, yes. um, uh, no, that's helpful, and thank you for walking me through it. Um, in that case, I am supportive and can be. I, I will say, um, on principle, almost always uh, ask that we do stick to review and action for the comments you know, about the public procedure made earlier and, and just allowing it to be out there for feedback and whatnot. But um, uh, yeah, just want to put that out there. Thank you. So are, just so I know, is that an objection and you want to make sure this goes to review and action or you are in, in this situation prepared to support it if nobody else has? I wouldn't it? object. I would request that the request isn't made, um, but wouldn't object if it is, if that makes sense. No. <laughs> <laughs> I often don't, but no, I wouldn't object. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Regent Gully. Oh. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you so much uh, to the um, Governance and Policy oh. Committee. You've okay. done a ton of really good work on this, and I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Regent Halen, for all the uh, closing, sort of bringing things together. It's really helpful yeah. to hear sort of the thought process around it and, and like how these things connect. Um, one of the things, uh, oh, and I also, so I wrote notes because I was trying to formulate my thoughts. So <laughs> um, also Regent Farnsworth, wanna echo um, 
the thoughts about how important this is for transparency with the public. Um, but one of the things that I've thought about a lot over the last almost year that I've been on this board, which is um, wild because it goes very quickly, is um, when we see everything, we have a chance of seeing nothing because there's just so many things to pay attention to that it can be really tricky to try to have oversight over too many things as well. So, um, so in that sense, that in initially, I really had um, some deep questions about increasing these thresholds, and um, I feel like I support this, given the especially given the real thought that's gone into um, making sure that the right things get in front of us. Um, uh, there is something that I want to. Um, take into account, and I'm not sure that it comes into this conversation, but I do feel like it's really important. Um, so just as an example, we've had a number of people um, and groups and campus organizations contact us in the last few months about our contract through MinCor. Um, this is, at this point, it's a very small contract in, the, in terms of the university, it's about $50,000 a year. Um, and so it would never have come in front of us at all based on the thresholds, based on the previous thresholds, the current, the thresholds that we're moving toward, like, but, um, I think we should have a deeper discussion about, um, ethics and purchasing, uh, that may be separate from this conversation about, um, designations and oversight, but I do think that it's an important conversation for us to have. And maybe there's another place where we have it. Maybe it is part of this conversation. I'm not sure. Um, but I think that I've generally heard agreement that, that we feel like, and, and anyone is welcome to speak up and say they don't agree with this, but I, I think general feeling that I've gotten from other regions is, hey, why do we even have this contract anymore? This doesn't feel like a good thing. It doesn't feel like a good thing for the public. It doesn't feel like a good thing for our reputation as a university. It doesn't feel like an ethical thing to do. So I would just like to raise the idea that um, perhaps in addition to having this conversation about amounts, that we have a deeper conversation around ethics and purchasing and how we decide who, are, who we're going to work with as a university. Mm -hmm. Uh, Regent Verhalen, did you wish to respond? Yeah, just really briefly, I appreciate the question and definitely think that that conversation is best had outside of this policy for reservation delegation of authority. Um, I think we have other policies that would fit, that that conversation would fit better in and also give us a more fulsome opportunity to get um, what the impacts of that would be, but also get input from others. And so, Chair Mayron, uh, I would ask that board leadership consider that topic for work plan development for the next schedule, uh, whether we do it through government policy or through the full board, but that be part of next our upcoming work plan discussion as far as where we can have that conversation and gather input from the university community. Good comment, uh, Regent Gully, and, and I think that uh, Regent Verhalen's suggestion is a good suggestion as well. Um, it'll be a really good discussion with all the constituencies. All right, uh, Regent Tad Johnson, I think that's our last uh, person who would like to comment here. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna commend the committee for its work on this. And this reminds me of, um, <laughs> When I was working for the Congress as an attorney, every couple of years we would update, um, do a technical corrections bill on Title 25 uh, in view of inflation changes in from the Supreme Court, changes in laws and stuff. To me, that's what this is. This is a technical, uh, you know, going through, making technical changes and and if we need to do it again, you know, in a year or two, then we do it. But I suggest we push it through. Um, and I don't know if we need to spend that much more time on it personally. And I do want one last personal note. As a University of Minnesota retiree, <laughs> I'm very happy we're 
just going to follow federal laws uh, <laughs> as opposed to fighting with the feds. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Regent Johnson. That's a good idea. All right, I'm not hearing any objection uh, to the policy as it has been um, proposed to us that, that is in the DACA material. So I think it would be appropriate at this time, Regent Hipsch, if you wanted to make your motion. Uh, so moved. Second. All right, any further discussion on the uh, proposed policy changes that are set forth in the docket? All right, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion carries. And I bet our administration is thrilled. So yeah, I've seen some clapping of hands. Chair Mayron, I, I think our full university community should be thrilled because this, I see the closing of those loophole, those loopholes, those holes in the prior policy is yeah. really important yeah, to some great. of the points around um, accountability. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right, we now at this point move to the reports of the committees. There's only one committee has met since last February's meeting, since our February meeting, and that's the Litigation Review Committee. Regent, Regent Tad Johnson, your report, please. Yeah, give me one minute here. <laughs> Uh, the litigation review committee met on February 13th, 2024. At this meeting, we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to the attorney client privilege. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. That was less than a minute. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, at this time we will consider a resolution to close the rest of the meeting to discuss matters of attorney-client privilege with counsel. Mr. Steves, would you please read the resolution? Madam Chair, the resolution is Regents of the University of Minnesota resolution to conduct non-public meeting of the Board of Regents to, Regents to discuss attorney-client privilege matters, whereas based on advice of the General Counsel, the Board of Regents have balanced the purposes served by the open meeting law and by the attorney-client privilege and determined that there is a need for absolute confidentiality to discuss litigation strategy and particular matters involving the University of Minnesota. Now, therefore, be it resolved that in accordance with Minnesota Statutes 13D.01 Subdivision 3 and 13D.05 Subdivision 3B, a non-public meeting of the Board of Regents be held on Friday, March 8th, 2024 in the boardroom, 600 McNamara Alumni Center for the purpose for the purpose of an attorney-client privilege discussion of litigation, including the following. One, in re-college athlete NIL litigation. Uh, two, Carter v. NCAA. Three, Hubbard v. NCAA. All right. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Any discussion? I just let it go. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. We will now take a short recess to end the live stream and allow those in the boardroom to leave. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, this was uh, quite a, a robust uh, meeting and an excellent discussion, excellent presentations all around. Uh, so we will adjourn. Uh, board members, if you'd like to bring your box lunches into the horseshoe, feel free to do so. We'll be adjourned for 15 minutes.